there are your other midfielder no surprises Steve, yeah Steve McManaman Steve McManaman uh, I mean I've mentioned before about the two greatest players you know in, in Liverpool's history you talk about King Kenny and, uh, and obviously Stevie G If you get book tokens, also you could buy some really random. You don't pick yourself. It's we want to get a sense of who you really rate. Yeah. So uh, you knew this. You knew this. <laughs> uh, well, you, you know what, Joe? Yes, I, I did. I, I did know that. But I'm, I'm thinking, uh, and you might put me in a place here, but I'm trying to think of of good scouts players who I've played with who, who can score goals. And don't get me wrong, I have played with them, but they're not playing ahead of me. <laughs> not a chance. Not a chance. So I've, I've just told, told you the team that, I want to win every honour, right? I want to win everything. And you got Stephen, uh, Steve, Stephen Gerrard. You got Cara, Jamie Carragher, you got Steve McManaman. Got the keeper who, who people will find it tough. And I'm a believer. If you've got that team and, and me as a striker in front of them, I'm going to score goals. And we're going to win games. And we're going to win trophies. So there's no chance. I, I know what you're saying, and I take that on board. But when I when I was thinking of the team and uh, the, the scouts team, uh, I wanted. I've got to be in it. I've got to be in it, Joe. I'm not arguing. And I, you know, I, I, I wanted to be in it because, because I'll, I'll, help, I'll help us win something. Right? So reluctantly and, and with humility, I'm picking myself, says uh, Robbie Fowler. You're in, you're in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and, I, and you know what I'd do? I'd, I'd play me all the time as well. No kidding, no kidding. Um, listen, we've taken up so much of your day. It's been so enjoyable, though. Really enjoyed it. And, and best of luck with the management career and beyond. Robbie Fowler, thank you. Pleasure, mate. Thanks very much. Cheers. That was uh, the great Robbie Fowler with us. All with thanks to Cadbury, official global partner of Liverpool Football Club. And you can check out cadburyfc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Robbie Fowler there. Off the ball. Ronnie Whelan could play, by the way. And let me tell you, he's talking about people being dirty when you could tackle. He was filthy. Oh, really? Oh! oh. Yeah. Dear me. Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app.
OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Half past seven on this Tuesday morning. You're welcome along to OTB AM. Owen and Ger with you right the way through until 10 o'clock this morning. And we're going to have Louise Galvin with us a little bit later on to chat rugby. We'll have Daniel Harris with us to set the scene for the remaining games in the midweek Premier League. We'll chat to him a little bit about that. Manchester United postponement as well. And we're also going to be joined by Keelan Kilrell a little bit later on. He's one of uh, the athletes who helped Ireland to cross-country gold at under-23 level on Sunday. So he came sixth in the race and uh, the team obviously came out on top in that one in Abbottstown. So he'll be with us a little bit later on as well. You can tweet us at Off The Ball if you want to get in touch about anything or drop a comment on the YouTube stream if that's where you're getting us. Uh, Ger, how are you keeping? Okay, I'm drinking some disgusting Lemsip Owen, so when I'm broadcasting from home, that'll tell you how I'm getting on. Ooh, te- tell, us, tell us what the, the prognosis is. Mm. <coughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered the question right there. What? There you go. Well, why are you on the Lemsip? Because uh, it makes you feel better, Owen. Yeah. It, it gives you a bit of momentary respite from the general feeling of shitness in your life. Uh, well, at least you'd be over it by Christmas, right? Sometimes the crime is, is worse than the punishment, though, right? Oh, sorry, the cure is worse than the disease. Lemsip is disgusting. Like, it really is. There's nothing you can do to sex it up. Maybe a bit of whiskey, but it's a bit early for that. That's an, actually, that's a very, very good idea. Whiskey with the paracetamol and it could be a little bit dangerous, but but I'm all on board for that. What what flavour Lemsip are we going with? Oh, it's blackcurrant. The only one that is uh, in any way acceptable. You should try try lemon now. That's actually... And then just no. dose it with honey and... I mean, I do the lemon and honey thing, but it's still gross. The lemon is just... Uh, it's the it's the taste of your, like, college years when, you know, you were, like, smoking and wondered why you had uh, resp- upper respiratory tract. It's like, well, I can't take these two things. I keep getting them. Not that I ever smoked, of course. Of course. Uh, and sorry, what does, uh, what, what's the, the, the hangover from the lemon like? It's just, it makes you feel the exact same way? It feels like your insides are burning? Uh, the hangover? The, what, what, what's, the, what's the comparison? How is Lemsip like smoking cigarettes in college? Oh, no, that's when I remember the lemon. Uh. When that, was the, that was what you would do to get over the, the perpetual illness that you suffered in first year in college. That's a good tip. These are good life tips from... Uh, from no, 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 writing. no, no. The only good tip is never smoke. It's, uh, it's ridiculous. Okay, well, that's an even better tip. I mean, we've got uh, lots of sage advice coming your way this morning over the course How of... How are you getting on with that one? Uh, very well, very well. Uh, absolutely flying it on that front. Um, there's a couple of things we want to, to get stuck into this morning, Ger, before we tell you what's coming up. There's uh, two things. So the first thing, will we actually do Stephen Kenny right off the top here before we get into to the rugby scenario? Because yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah. Um, so, this is a pretty big development, it seems, that's come out of uh, a meeting that Jonathan Hill was, was speaking at and uh, his... Another leaky FAI meeting. Yeah, yeah, what's take take us through this from from what you've been reading on this? Um, so Jonathan Hill had like a long presentation to I I forget which branch of the various subcommittee to the subcommittee. This is the the General Assembly. The it's like whatever highfalutin title they have themselves. Um, and it's the it's the layer underneath the board, right? Um, this is one of those kind of ones that in person would have been a meeting somewhere out near the red cow perhaps and <clears throat> there would have been like you know malcontents at the floor and there would have been doorstepping of Jonathan Hill going in going are you going to talk about the contract um and he did talk about the contract but not not as like a, a, a top line thing um he said that he is I think in answer to a question that the conversations with Stephen Kenny are ongoing and that he's working on a deal to take Kenny through to the end of the Euro 2024 qualifiers that's the first time that that has been made public. Now, it wasn't actually made public public. It was at a meeting, which I suspect was not supposed to have been reported on. But uh, fair play to John Fallon in The Examiner. He's got the story. I see Gavin Cooney's had it as well. Um, and there's um, comments from an individual who actually, I don't know if you've got the very specific question in front of you, who was disappointed. There's, there's, definitely, yeah. there's definitely still a group of people within Irish football who don't care how we play football. Mm-hmm. Um who seem to have quite senior roles in Irish football and they're all about the, it's a results game. But I mean, it's not, I mean, you know, if, if every if everything is a results game and every <clears throat> under six match, uh, we'll have Tiger parenting from the sidelines telling everybody to get stuck in. And that's not good for your football culture. But anyway, what was the question? Yeah, well, just, just on that, like, I mean, it, it, he was addressing 100 members of, of the FAI's National Assembly on, on a virtual call. So I guess the fact that this leaks out eventually is no surprise when you've got that many people on a call. 
but just a quote from John Fallon's piece, which is on page six of the Irish Examiner sports section this morning. When questions were invited at the conclusion of Jonathan Hill's address, the first came from Joey Malone, the former Dundalk double winner and now assistant manager of women's National League title holders, Shelburne. It centred on Kenny's admission midway through the World Cup campaign in September that his real objective was reaching the next Euros. This assertion was interpreted by Malone as tantamount to treating the team as a development squad, whereas qualification for major tournaments and the financial rewards necessary for an association such as the FAI carrying £62 million of debt should be prioritised. I think everybody will agree with you, replied Hill. Every international team, be it the seniors or underage sides, both boys and girls want to win the games that they play in. Stephen is no different to any other international manager. He goes on to say that I understand the thrust of your question. Stephen has brought in 15 players from the 21s and therefore he's finding the right balance between youth and experience. So that line is out there within the National Assembly of the FAI that this was treated as a development squad, that they've taken Stephen Kenny's words and and have ta- and have sought meaning from it. And the end result of that is that they feel that Stephen Kenny is treating this as a development squad or has been treating this as a development squad, which is which is a leap. I, I, I think it's fair to say. I think, I think certainly that was not what he was trying to say whatsoever. I think there was probably a heavy dose of reality for a lot of Irish football fans when Stephen Kenny did come out with that a few months ago about where exactly Ireland uh, and their priority should lie. But also, he shouldn't really need to, to actually clarify that. I mean, you look at the statistics, you look at the last 20 years and the, the lack of success in terms of qualifying for a World Cup, it almost didn't even need to be said. He's kind of almost saying the obvious, but it's been taken up here as, uh, as if he's treating this team as a development squad. Yeah, look, <clears throat> as I said, there's a cohort of people in Irish football who are not in favour of what Stephen Kenny is trying to do. They don't want us to play good quality football. They don't want us to have an, a manager who's got a League of Ireland background. I'm not saying that's the, the uh, this single individual, but there's definitely a cohort of people who are trying to smear Kenny at every available opportunity. And like, it's just boring at this stage, right? It's it's like, it's the type of pygmy thinking which has taken us nowhere. Like, what what... what what, what's our future going to be like if we're perpetually trying to win games with mediocre players as opposed to trying to build a style and an identity? Like, we, we keep having this conversation again and again and again and again and again and again. Now, it's all going to be on the line over the next two years and Stephen Kenny either succeeds or fails. But it looks like he's going to be given the opportunity to do so. Hopefully, there's no stereotypical nonsense from the FAI in terms of strings attached around like, oh, we're going to appoint a new assistant manager who will report back to us after every training session about the, you know, that kind of crap that we've seen in the past. Because it's clear that uh, that the FAI still has a way to go before it is an organization that is entirely fit for purpose. And maybe we're getting there slowly. It seems like, in fairness to Jonathan Hill, uh, he has taken his time. He has navigated the choppy waters of the politics so far up to this point and they're they're making good appointments and they're they're restructuring departments and it looks like they're trending in the right direction but until we start seeing commercial results that reflect the uh the the position that football holds within ireland until we have a shirt sponsor until we have news coming through about those two next friendlies in march like that's the challenge for the organizational side of things and that's the challenge for the fai and that's the challenge for the board like they're responsible for that too you know they can't just sit there as hurlers on the ditch criticising stuff, they actually have to get stuck in and help and and stop leaking. Uh, until we see that, that that stuff coming to fruition, it's hard to judge how, how well or otherwise uh, or how good a job Jonathan Hill is doing. But so far, it seems like he's doing an okay job. And hats off to him. Because they, they made a good appointment last week as a, the new COO coming over from the FA in England. Um, he's an Irishman. He's coming back to live in Ireland. So... You know, fingers crossed he hits the ground running and we can look forward with some kind of sense of this is an organization that is unified, that has a unity of purpose. And, you know, there's always going to be dissenting voices at meetings like this. That's fair enough. But I'd love to I'd love to know exactly what these people want. Those uh, friendlies that you mentioned in March are important. They're possibly not on the level of the the new shirt sponsor and that that's going to be a, a huge part of the, the next couple of years as well. But it does seem that the Portugal game was possibly the the highest point from a commercial standpoint in years for the FAI because obviously there was the the scandal at the end of 2019 which ran straight into the pandemic and they haven't been able to turn over much cash whatsoever and then all of a sudden having a full house with Ronaldo in town was just this this massive boon for them it seemed and now they're trying to recapture that but you'd imagine the clock is ticking on actually getting 
an opponent lined up of that same caliber, and I'd be astonished if it was anybody of that of that same standard. And there's a centenary. England, 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 you think? Yeah, I think England's a possibility. You know, the right. policing around that would be very difficult. But like, well, you got to you got to think that we did them a favour when they needed a friendly, when we sent over the team, remember the video, video gate? Uh, mm. So a good opportunity for us to rehash video gate all through again, get Damien Dusk views on it this time. Um, I mean, that that is a possibility. And then, you know, there's various other countries who might do us a favour. Would uh, would France or Germany do us a favour for our centenary? They might. Possibly. Uh, just to uh, give you the exact quote on the 2024 aspect of it, this is from Jonathan Hill. He said he had more success in that towards the back end of the World Cup qualification campaign. Sadly, we didn't qualify for the World Cup. I'm working with and talking to Stephen about hopefully taking him forward in relation to the Euro 2024 qualification. So that would sound pretty positive. I would suggest that the contract that is going to be on the table is going to be one that will take him to the end of the Euros as opposed to one that will, I don't know, see out the Nations League or... Oh, no, they can't They can't go back on that now. Yeah. Um, I'm taking this as, like, if there's a if there's an issue, it's because of some nonsensical clauses or the money's not right. Like, it's not... I'm taking this as red now. But Jonathan Hill is telling that assembly yesterday that they're working out a deal to the end of the Euros. Then that, that has to be the case, right? Yeah, like I think if you're if you're suggesting and putting a year out there and then to go back on that afterwards would be uh, would be pretty astonishing. But like I do think also there was the aspect of of when the deal actually gets signed or when the deal actually gets offered. And I think that there was two parts of it. Like the, the first part was actually getting a deal offered in this calendar year as opposed to after the Nations League fixtures in June or in the summertime whenever they finish up. Uh, and then the second part was when that contract would actually end. So um, until 2024 makes sense, you suspect they think he's the right man for the job. You may as well back him for the next proper campaign, the next the next full campaign, which is obviously going to be that qualification for Germany in 2024. Um, the the other story this morning, Joe, which is dominating proceedings, just to give you a bit of a flavour of how it's being covered in a couple of the papers, is the story with regards to, to the IRFU and uh, the letter that was written to the Department of Sport last Friday, which leaked out yesterday, subsequently sparking a response from the IRFU, which uh, was perhaps ill-advised at best, and then also sparking a response from the Department of Sport, who said they want to meet the IRFU themselves. In the space of a few hours yesterday, this whole thing blew up to a level that perhaps the story hadn't even been at. Even in the aftermath of the, of the Anthony Eddy press conference last month, this feels that this, is, this has gone nuclear in a way that that hadn't. And the list of names that was on the bottom of that letter is astonishing, especially when you consider the amount of current players willing to put their head above the parapet on this and willing to put their name on the bottom of that letter. The, the papers, uh, the examiner going with managing the breakdown, the IRFU rejects criticism from players as crisis hits Irish women's rugby. You've got Kieran Shannon as well writing on the back page saying tide may be about to turn as players take a stand. Uh, in the Irish Times, it's a, a photograph there uh, current and former Ireland players express loss of trust and faith in the IRFU. And then Johnny Waterson is commenting on it, saying, this is not about money, this is about respect for the players. This nuclear option shows that the group felt there was no prospect of change from the IRFU. And it's also the lead then in, in the Irish Independent this morning. IRFU hauled in over women's row. Government demand meeting after current and former players lose trust in union. I'm not sure what your initial reaction was to, to this yesterday, Ger, but uh, the reaction from the IRFU was as extraordinary as the letter itself, it seemed to me. Um, have, you, have you got the, have you read the reaction of the IRFU there? The, the specific letter that they yeah. released yesterday? Uh, yeah, I've got, like, I can get the full letter up here if you want. Well, just as bits of it that are like, they, they didn't say, okay, we're listening, we hear this, yeah. we take on board what you're saying. They were like, no, no, you can't say this now. No, 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 no. We have two separate investigations ongoing. What are you doing? You're, you're like, you're influencing the outcome of this investigation, um, which I thought was an interesting. Uh, you know, so, so what you're talking about here is um, a stakeholder group coming to you and saying we're incredibly upset with how you deal with us historically, like all the way back, and now, and we're very concerned about what the future is. And your response is. But I'm dealing with the current issue. I'm very busy dealing with the current issue. And you've signed up to this. And we've got somebody independent talking about it. It's like, okay, but the current issue isn't the only issue. It turned out that what's going on now seems to be going on for a very long time. And we are concerned because historically, you have been unable to grapple with the issues. And 
we believe that you're currently unable to grapple with the issues and that into the future you're going to be unable to grapple with the issues. And the IRFU have come out fighting. Which, you know, it's, um, it's interesting to be at war with your own people. And to be, uh, we're welcoming. We, we have, you know, we've got a, a pathway plan. We've got all these under 14 and under 16 and, and under 18 teens. And the numbers are great and they're growing. It's like, I don't know, it, it seems tone deaf. It seems like strategically it's a bad move when, when, when one of your key stakeholders comes and says, we're really upset about something, you're supposed to go, okay, this is a very powerful thing that you've done. I see the, I see the large group, that this isn't just a, a small cohort or a rump of people, that this is actually all of the biggest names that there have ever been in Irish women's rugby have come together and said, stop. And so we're going to say, okay, we're listening. But they didn't. They said, we're fighting. And we're already doing some of the stuff that you want us to do anyway. And uh, and I don't know, I think fair play. Like it, it's the type of move that has immediately awoken the government's... Now, hang on, did it, did it immediately awaken the, the government or did the government get changed into taking some action when the letter got leaked? Which, well, that's oh, that's oh, the thing. You know. like that, that's, that's a really interesting question because obviously the letter was sent on Friday. This, was, this letter was not sent yesterday. And the first... We saw that. Do we know was, was it emailed? I'm not, was it? Was it? Good question. Was it now that we don't know, that we don't like, know. I'm sure it was emailed. Carrier. Like, uh, it could have been. It yeah. could have been any of those things. Uh, so maybe, maybe it was resting in the inbox. Yeah. And as soon as they saw it in the inbox, after they read it in the forty-two, they're like, "Did somebody send us an email? Oh, quick, man. quick! Oh, we had it on Friday. What? We had it on Friday." Uh, but perhaps a bit of uh, benefit of the doubt could be could be afforded there, but certainly it was the forty two where, where where we read this first yesterday, where where it gets released. So um, that would suggest that there was maybe a little bit of a. Did you get my email uh, about that, or did did you get the, uh, the 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 arrival of the letter, the hand delivered letter from from our side of things? Like you say, it's a tone deaf the response. Like, is is that even being a little bit kind? Is there not a, a like a, a different, more kind of paternalistic tone that actually exists around the whole thing? Like the one thing that stood out to me, like I mean, I'm sure people had had different. You're saying it's mansplaining. The IRFU are mansplaining to the greatest women's rugby players of all time in Ireland about what they're doing and the process they're involved in. Is that what you're saying? It, it definitely has a bang of that when you read this line. The responsible approach would be to allow these reviews progress. I, I saw that. Work that was like, if you could just stop being women for a second and just be responsible, says the IRFU. You're like, what? What are you doing here? Excuse me? Mm. Oh, my God. That was definitely like, um, are we sure we want to just write this this way? Are you sure? Could we maybe just pass this through a lens where... Somebody has a look at it, you know? Like, all the women on our committee should have a look at this and see what they... Oh, okay, good point. There's hardly any. It, it's like... A, like it, I would also then kind of like to know what they kind of view to be the, the solution because there does seem to be maybe a bit of a theme emerging here. And I think I do think that, like, Johnny Waterson and that... Like, just the headline on that piece, this is not about money, this is about respect for the players. Like that really hits home, I think, with the Anthony Eddy press conference from, from last month, which I've already mentioned like that. The thing that's kind of sparked this, really, if, if, if we're being fair, like the, the, this thing really did become a, a big story. Obviously, the, the World Cup, um, the, the lack of qualification for the World Cup w- was a huge part of this. And then Anthony Eddy obviously does his press conference in response to that and is asked about it in response to that. But he really did light this whole thing up with his comments. Like the, the, both programmes, and he's talking about the 7s and 15s, both programmes have had a lot of resources from the RFU thrown at them in recent years. Like, and it, it, it's kind of like the, the responsible tone would have been to do this, money thrown at them. The, these sort of little indicators of, of what the true attitudes are that I think yeah. uh, enlighten a lot of us and, and throw a lot of light on, on what their view is of, of, of the women's game, that they feel that the what's the solution here? More money. And in reality, what we saw yesterday is that the solution is not more money whatsoever. The solution has to come from a place where the attitudes change drastically. The IRFU keep telling us who they are. They keep telling us what they are as an organization. And uh, and sometimes we ignore it. But it, it's impossible to ignore with this statement, with the press conferences that they've done, with the with the bullish. No, no, no. We've got this. We know exactly what, what they're what we're doing. And and like they, there has definitely been an attempt to separate the women's team and talk about factions within the women's team about how it's just a few disgruntled players who were driving this. And that's the power of the statement. They've gone back historically to get the biggest names in Irish rugby history 
and get them to sign this. So it's not just some current players who are disaffected with the previous management team or anything like that. This is historically, this sport, women's rugby, has not been treated properly by the governing body to the point now where we're talking to the government about it. On the day when the government was supposed to be basking in the glory of having doled out 19 million to rugby, 20 million to the GAA, 19 million to the uh, FAI. It was supposed to be a red letter day for Irish sport. Look at the money, look at how we look at how we care about sport and it got ruined because all of the biggest names in Irish women's rugby history signed a letter to say the IRFU is not fit for purpose when it comes to women's rugby. Incredibly powerful mm. and and the response was the mansplain and it's like well, what are you doing lads? You could make the case that the red letter day for Irish sport still very much exists in the context of, of the government because in fairness I mean you, you can question the timing and, and what sparked them to act but they have acted and they have called for a meeting with the IRFU on the day that they've promised about 18, 19 million to them as a result of, of COVID that they're in a powerful position now they're in a powerful position to be able to call a few shots around here and in fairness they kind of did do that that they like that is a fact I mean they have issued a statement where they, they are going to, to bring the IRFU in and does it really matter how that is actually arrived at? Does it matter that it took a couple of days? Maybe it does, but that is the fact of, of what happened here. So I would suggest that they're actually in a pretty powerful position to, to do something and to, to perhaps bring the IRFU in and, and, and change their view on, on what's actually going on here and, and to perhaps just shed can some I, light because that's what they want. That's what the players want here. Yeah. Can, can I just point out, so there's a story for a quick, it took me eight seconds less than that to Google. Owen Cormack had a story from March 2021 where Jack Chambers said, sports failing to meet gender balanced targets should face funding cuts, right? And a quick search for the IRFU, uh, the no, great number of, of NGBs that are falling below the 30% mark. It's not even 50%, 30%. The GA 11, the FAI 25%, and the IRFU 8%. Right. 8% of the the mark, which is low at 30% in terms of gender balance, uh, they haven't hit it. Is the IRFU behaving like an organization with 8% female representation? Yes, it is. It's behaving like an organization like that. And so Jack Chambers should say, if the minister really wants to actually follow through on what he says, he should say, your next funding tranche is not going to be released until you fix this situation and you fix the situation on your boards and on your committees to make sure that the, the 8%, it's absolutely ludicrous. That's why the IRFU are in this situation. Because they don't understand. Because they don't have anybody that they can turn to and go, well, how does this sound? Oh, a bit patronising, a bit mansplainy. Okay, shit, we need to do something different. No, no, no. I mean, we've shown loads of money at this. Who do they think they are looking for equality? What is this? It, I don't know. I, it's It's... The IRFU keep telling us who they are. And we should stop ignoring that. And we should start, the government should start, with our money, should start saying, no, you can't have taxpayers' money unless you follow through on the commitments that you all signed up to and you all agreed to. And if you can't do it, you need to tell us why. Yeah, and I think that there's a, a number of different things that you can point to over the last little while as well. Again, there is just an endless pit of things here, but even you see like Lynn Cantwell's name on the the letter over the course of uh, the weekend or the one that got leaked yesterday and so how was that allowed to happen that she was able to go to South Africa and, and, and get a, a, a an incredibly important job down there without any sort of effort to try and keep her in the country first of all and I do think because we've got a lot of men here who can do that job Owen and I'm sure that's exactly how it should be isn't it and then, the, the big jobs are for the lads and then also obviously then you've got well, what doesn't make this any easier if we're being blunt about it is the fact that maybe the FAI isn't uh, the the, the organisation to hold up and to, to follow as an example but on the pitch you have a Republic of Ireland women's team which is succeeding at the moment you have a league and certainly a national team in England rugby wise I mean that is succeeding at the moment so in your own sport in a different country you've got a success story and in your own country with a different sport you've got a success story and that kind of backs you into a corner where you really do have to start asking questions of yourself but that doesn't seem to be happening right now maybe that changes as a result of what we've seen over the last couple of days right it is I hope so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big opportunity like for all the criticism of the IRFU, if they actually just shut up and listened, it's a big, big opportunity for them to say, okay, do you know what? We were wrong. You're right. We're going to take this moment to listen and we're going to build a pathway that takes on board all of the feedback. That might be a very difficult process for us, but we could have a citizens assembly style thing 
where and it's a really good model that actually builds consensus and allows everybody to have their viewpoint and then has a measure of democracy for it. You could easily do that for the future of women's rugby. And then, you know what? The other thing is money does solve a lot of these issues. Money creates the, the pathway and the architecture and the background. And all of a sudden you have like 50, 55 people who are employed, whatever, whatever the number is, who are, whose job it is to do this full time and not part time. You can't you can't have this like we're we're going to ride two horses at the same time. So money is always helpful in fixing these issues. It's five to eight on this Tuesday morning. You're with us here on OTB AM. It's brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Let's tell you what's coming up this morning. We've got Daniel Harris on standby. We'll get to him in just a moment. Louise Galvin will be with us after eight o'clock to run through some of those rugby storylines, the sports pages at half eight and the sports news with John Duggan coming your way at 20 to nine. We're going to be joined then by Keelan Kilrehel, uh, the Sligo runner who was involved in that under-23 cross-country success at the weekend from 10 to nine. And then after nine o'clock, then Phil Egan will be with us and half past nine is last night's chat with Pat Nevin. Right, at 7.56 on this Tuesday morning, it is time to welcome Daniel Harris back to the show. Daniel, how are you getting on? Uh Oh, all right, thanks. How's it going? Yeah, good. So, which was a, a more traumatic experience for you yesterday? The uh, Manchester United Brentford game being thrown into chaos, or Manchester United being pulled out of the bowl twice on the one Champions League draw? Or the final episode of Succession? Oh, well, there uh, we go. That's, that's, that's <laughs> clearly number one. Yeah, it was, it was a hard day. Um, <laughs> it felt, I mean, the Champions League draw is. I mean, it's. I think that Paris obviously is a harder draw than Atletico. I think United are good enough to beat either of them. But, and there is something I guess I will miss about watching Neymar, Lionel Messi, and um, and Kylian Mbappe running running at Harry Maguire. I feel like we might have missed out on uh, some slapstick gold there. But, um, it, well, I mean, it was one of those things actually, because I was blogging it for The Guardian and it felt like, when you do a live blog, I'm looking at my fingers because I'm typing, I'm looking at the screen, I'm looking at the console, and I could see that it was dodgy. And it was funny afterwards to see UEFA say, well, we had some kind of external technical services provider that made a mistake. It was just like, well, what about the people that were doing the draw that could obviously see that something had gone wrong because I could see and I wasn't even looking properly and so could everyone else who was watching and then they went and blamed someone else and because they obviously elected just to plough through and hope that nobody noticed when ev- obviously everyone was going to notice but the team that got by Munich decided to complain by amazing coincidence also. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, I mean, what, what a state of affairs. Um, I mean, they're hot on the heels of that whole F1 situation also. It's like millions of people are watching. They will notice. And it's that kind of proceeding as though everyone is an idiot, which, I mean, we all kind of are, but we're not idiotic in the sense that we're going to not notice everything. We're going to we're idiotic in the sense that we're humans, so obviously we're all idiots, and we're idiotic in the sense that we're absolute bitches for sport, but we're still going to notice when things aren't as they're meant to be. And uh, that, was, uh, that was definitely one of those situations where they... They tried to cover it up, but they, in the end, apologised to cover up quickly enough so that no one had to lose their jobs or anything. There's, there's, there was like two great moments of potential karma that came out on social media yesterday. The, the first one was obviously Real Madrid kicking up a fuss about not getting the chance <laughs> to play Benfica again. But also kind of under the radar was Atletico Madrid's tweet talking about the fact that they were looking for an explanation and a solution after the draw went a bit awry because they were essentially denied the opportunity to play Manchester United. I mean, the levels of dressing room wall content that Ralph Randy <laughs> could be able to find from that Atletico Madrid tweet. Yeah, um... I mean, that's sort of a nice way of saying uh, we really don't want to be playing by Munich here. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, United you know, Athletic. I felt like that aside. When I was when I I wrote this at the time that the first draw I found extremely unexciting. That I guess yeah. the biggest tie was United Paris, but we've seen that recently. We saw it twice last season. We saw it the season before the season before that twice as well, and. But that is, I mean, that's sort of one of the things, like the balance that the modern Champions League has is you lose a lot of the specialness of drawing ties because teams play each other the whole time. But if you get two teams who are good at the same time, you get those kind of rivalries that are also nice to have. But United-Paris is not a game that I think anyone particularly... I, I mean, I, I didn't feel obliged to see that. 
Whereas I think now the tie is a little bit more interesting. I'd much rather watch Man City play Sporting Lisbon, who I think are a much better team than Villarreal, who City were just absolutely monsters. I mean, they might monster Sporting as well. I mean, they're good enough to do that to pretty much any team in the world almost. But I think that that would be a much more interesting contest. Um, Liverpool too good for Inter, although Inter have, are better now than they were a little while ago. And Zeko has actually replaced the Kaku quite nicely. So that that's not it's not a gimme. But it does seem that it'll be a little more interesting now than it was. I'm definitely more interested in watching more of the ties than I was previously. Uh, Dan, we haven't had you on since uh, Ranier's taken over, since he's actually got his teeth uh, stuck into this team over the last week, I guess. Obviously, we're not going to get any evidence of that in midweek. But had you started to see real early signs of a mini revolution at the club? Uh, I, don't, I mean, it takes time. But I mean, what has happened, obviously, is they've won two games uh, and they've kept two clean sheets. And what they're doing quite effectively is blocking up the middle of the pitch. The the reservation that I have is that he's so we, they're playing this 4-2-2-2, which I know Rannick likes, and I totally see why it's a good formation. That in theory, it allows you to dominate the centre and to get out wide. They haven't quite worked out the getting out wide yet. And at the moment, the system's getting the most out of Fred and McTominay, and it's getting almost the least out of Bruno and Jaden Sancho, who are probably the two two most creative, best players in the team almost. Bruno's been the best player in the team for the last three years. Um, so I do wonder if that, if that will change. I mean, it'll change a bit because they'll get better at playing those roles. But Sancho is someone I want to see coming from out to in because... I want him to. I want him to threat, not just threaten to go on the outside. I want him to sometimes go on the outside and put crosses in, particularly if you've got two strikers in the middle, one of whom is Ronaldo. So I'd much rather he was a little bit wider rather than relying on Dallo for the width on the right hand side. And similarly, Bruno is someone who is used to just being able to mooch about as he pleases, and that's worked quite well because. He just has an amazing talent for making goals happen, whether through passes or or scoring them himself. And against Norwich, Bruno started on the right of the two and Sancho on the left, which I found totally baffling because you've then got Bruno coming inside on his left foot. And I really see why you would want that. And although you've got Sancho coming in on his right, he's much less likely to go on the outside. And you, as I said, you, you want the threat that he might do that because one of the problems United have found over the last couple of seasons is that teams basically have been leaving uh, Juan Bissaka alone because they know that he's not going to do that. And Sancho enables you to stretch the pitch. But United have kind of made it narrower again, not just by inverting Sancho and Bruno, but by putting them inside at all, wherever they happen to be, because... No one's going to be that terrified of Dallo and Alex Tellez, who are playing pretty well. I mean, they're doing well enough to keep their places, but they're still struggling to get around the outside. And then Norwich played really well, but the way that they played, it always looked likely that United were going to need overloads on the touch lines rather than players kind of burrowing forwards. So... They've, they've got they've got some time now. I mean, I, I don't know if the Brighton game will go ahead, but even if it does... Uh, they've got ten. They've got ten days before the game after that, which is Newcastle. And if Brighton doesn't happen, they've got two weeks, and that's a decent amount of time to start drilling things properly, to start working out where people want to be. But at the back of my mind, not even at the back of my mind, at the forefront, the front of my mind, there's always that question of whether I think that this formation, though I think it's not a bad formation to play or for United to play, whether I think this the best way of getting the most out of the best players. And I still ultimately would like to see a midfield player turn up in January and then try and play 4-3-3. It, there's also been this kind of sense, and this kind of comes into the conversation about January that, that, that you mentioned there. There's been a sense that Ranić is going to be putting the foot down with regards to a couple of different scenarios. There has been an early suggestion that he's not a big fan of, say, Paul Pogba doing his rehabilitation abroad, for example. He wants his players recovering from injuries on site and, and he doesn't want them going anywhere. With regards to Anthony Martial, he's taken issue with his agent speaking in public. He says, I don't communicate with agents via the media and the press. The player hasn't spoken with me or with us about it. And to be honest, what his agent says via media is not that much of interest to me. I presume this is just who Raniak is. He's not trying to make a deliberate point, but I'd assume that's a pretty encouraging sign that you have a manager that is going to put the foot down in those regards. And to be honest with you, take a little less nonsense than Solskjaer might have stood for. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know if Solskjaer took nonsense or not, or if he was there was pressure put on him from above. But yeah, Ranick's in control, and it's very clear that he's used to running football clubs, and he has certain principles. And if you don't abide by them, then you know where the door is. And that's the way it should always be, really. There are very few players. I mean, Fergie obviously persuaded Ronaldo to stay an extra season um, in uh, in oh eight oh nine, but he was the difference between winning the league and not winning the league. So you might push the boat out for him. But otherwise, I think that United probably wanted Pogba gone a couple of summers ago, but no one was really that interested in buying him. Um, so you could, on the one hand, praise the way they handled him because he still got performances out of him sometimes. Enough performances that were good enough to get United into the Champions League in consecutive seasons, and Pogba was a part of that. But Martial is a different one because Martial is a player you don't want to keep anyway. And I'm sure that Rannick would be the same for more or less everyone, but Martial's a player they need to get rid of. And one of the reasons why Ole lost his job is that he wasn't ruthless enough at the end in getting rid of the players that needed to go. If he'd have shifted Bailly, Lingard, uh, Martial, um, Van der Beek, then he'd have been able to buy at least one midfield player. And in the end, obviously we can say, well, he wasn't good enough, so it worked out okay that he lost his job. If he'd have got that midfield player, then the season, I think, would have looked quite different for United and he probably would have done well enough to keep the job. And for Rannick, it's not really about that. It's about, if you, yeah, if you don't want to play for United, then, then buy. And uh, I'm sure most supporters would agree that that's, that's good because that's how it should be. You want people who are fully committed. In any event, Martial plays in a position where United have loads of options that aren't him. And I think part of the problem is that the club probably want to maximise the value of the players that they sell. And if everyone knows that the player wants to leave and the club want to sell them, that's much harder to do. But that only really works in practice because in theory, then what happens is you end up with the players stuck doing nout and getting paid. And you end up without the money to reinvest on the, in the areas of the team that you need it. So every press conference that Rannick has given since he started has shown a bloke who knows exactly what he wants and is calm, composed, and completely in control. And I mean, he nailed Anthony Martial and his agent and managed to insert the word whomever into a press conference in his second language. And uh, you can only admire that. Whether he's good enough to take United to where they want to go, again, we, we don't know till we see it. And if he is going to do it, then United will be the best team that he's ever managed because the best team that he's ever managed would not win the Premier League or the Champions League. So he is going to have to excel himself. But at the moment, he's conducting himself like someone who knows exactly what he's doing. And also, I guess, like someone who quite fancies hanging about in the job for longer than the end of the season. Well, that's quite important, isn't it? Because if he is genuinely capable of exerting some level of control, you would have to feel like he will be involved beyond the summertime in a meaningful way and not just as a consultant who they ring up and go, is this guy any good or not? Because if you're saying, and I think you're right, that these players need to leave, he may as well get rid of them at Christmas because having those extra bodies stuffing up training and blocking opportunity for young players, you don't know what those young players are capable of because you haven't given them game time because you've had to give game time to Pogba or whoever the, the rest of those list of players is. So do you expect meaningful January outgoings that actually he's going to rip the bandage off and go, right, you're all gone. Take whatever you can get. Like it, Cavani's linked this morning with Barcelona or whoever. Like, I think Cavani might actually work in this team, but if he's going... I mean, he works. Just Cavani's get a good player, now. but he's almost never available. And so he's, probably not, he's, prob he's yeah. probably not a first pick either. I mean, against teams that sit back like Norwich, there's actually something to be said for playing Cavani up front with Ronaldo because the pacing behind is almost irrelevant. And also Rashford's in horrible form at the moment, although he got better in the last half hour of that game. So Cavani, you might you might get rid of, but you're not getting any money for Cavani. You're just shifting the wages and you're shifting the pressure of the need to, to play him. But I don't think... I'm, so I wouldn't be surprised if Cavani left particularly, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he stayed. I think... I would. I, I wouldn't be. I think that Ling, I think the Lingard and Martial will, will go either on permanent deals or on loans if they can be found. Um, and one of the things that's noticeable is that when United need the goal against Palace, um, he, uh, he brought on Rank brought on uh, Anthony Langer, and Ole did that a lot at the beginning. When United need the goal in that that game against against Paris in, in Paris, he brought on uh, Taif Chong and Mason Greenwood. And as time progressed, he totally stopped doing anything like that. Like, Alanga was in a brilliant form in pre-season, and all he got under Ole was he got a substitute appearance at left wing-back against uh, West Ham in the League Cup. 
And he's someone who Ole thought was ready because he'd been talking about him. He'd seen on the pitch that he was ready to make a contribution in pre-season, but he couldn't bring himself to leave out players who were more renowned or older or whatever. Rani won't do that. He loves young players because he loves running and he loves young players because they're impressionable. And in the last couple of weeks, uh, Hannibal Medfrey has been playing brilliantly for Tunisia in the Arab Cup. And he's another one who you watch and you think this guy's quite close to ready. And I think that when he comes back, having played, having been playing international football, he's probably not going to be particularly keen on going back to playing in the under-23s. And he's also someone who looks like he can contribute. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a few players leave in, in, in January if United can find them places to go that they want to go to. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some of the younger players get some more football. I'm not sure Pogba will go, but I'd be surprised if Pogba stays. Although I was kind of heartened for what it's worth, that Rannick said on Friday that he sees Pogba in his formation as someone who plays in the two in front of the back four, not in the two behind the strikers. Because in the two behind the strikers, United have players who are the future of the club. And I don't really want Pogba taking appearances away from them because he's not here for the long, he's not United for the long term. And by saying you're going to play in the two in front is saying that you're going to have to play in that position, you're going to have to do some defending, you're going to have to run about, and if you don't want to do it, then you can leave. And that is the kind of message that Pogba could do with hearing. Even though people congratulated Ole, and I understand why, for keeping Pogba on side and getting performances out of him, it's at a point now, because we're at that next contract point, where United have to get either consistently excellent performances out of Pogba in a performance that doesn't hinder the development of the team, or they need to get rid, and preferably the latter, as far as I see it. And it's a shame, because I know that Pogba can be brilliant, but he can't be brilliant often enough, I don't think, for a team at United's level. He either needs to go into a team that's better than United and just be the bloke that produces the brilliant stuff, like he was for Juventus, or he needs to go somewhere else where he can play in a slightly more laid-back style because it's not going to work at United for him. No, it certainly seems that way at the moment. Daniel, great stuff this morning. Thanks a million. See you, everyone. Have a good day. Cheers. Daniel Harris there on the line. Right, it is 12 minutes past eight on this Tuesday morning. OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Pack show still to come on OTBAM. We're talking rugby with Louise Galvin next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Keep up to date with the latest WSL action and the biggest interviews. You'd be delighted, Karen, if you just had KD doing full-on attack. Oh, <laughs> this is this is the best team I've seen in weeks. Get her up there. <laughs> Subscribe to the Koi Gig podcast stream on the OTB Sports app now. He's a lion. He's a Grand Slam winner. He's Ireland's leading try scorer. And now you can hear him first, exclusively on the OTB Sports app. One of my abiding memories is having my cut opened up again as I got hit by the trophy in coppers on the dance floor. Join Brian O'Driscoll for the best insight and analysis this rugby season. We haven't had the usual kind of grenades from Gats that's gone, so we're creating them ourselves. Get the jump on everyone else. Download the OTB Sports app and turn on notifications now. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. You're welcome back. 13 minutes past eight. You're with us here on OTB AM. Delighted to welcome Louise Galvin back to the show. How are you getting on, Louise? You're not too bad now. On your cell phone? Yeah, all good. Uh, plenty to get stuck into. Just very quickly at the start, uh, we just need to mention the fact that you were one of the, the many names that signed off on the letter to the sports minister on Friday that was obviously published yesterday. There's obviously only so much that you can say at the moment, given things are going to play out over the next little while. But if you can, could you talk us through your decision, even if, if there even was a decision, to, to, to put your name on this letter? Um, yeah, so as I said, Owen, it's, it's, the letter is clearly there for everyone to see and we've had responses from the RFU, the Department of Sports, so we're not really going to say much more on it for the moment. But I guess, um, look, for myself, coming on platforms such as this and and RT and that would be a bit of a hypocrite maybe to, um, to not put my backing when you're looking for some change. So that's as much as I'm going to kind of say about it at the moment. Um, and let things, as I say, play out in the background and see where we go from here. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes over uh, the next little while, Louise. There's a couple of different things that we wanted to get stuck into from the weekend's rugby. We also want to get it stuck into a bit on referees as well a little bit later on, so we'll come back to that. But I guess, first of all, on the topic of Sunday and that unbelievable Munster win 
in Coventry. I'm not sure how well aware you were of some of the younger players that were coming through or some of the work that Ian Costello was doing in that Munster Academy, but it definitely seemed that a lot of people were surprised with the, the standards that they actually brought to proceedings and I guess that the positive light that it shows on the, the Munster Academy. Yeah, it's incredible. And I guess, again, like a lot of the academy players essentially are were, were on that trip to South Africa. So we're actually going even further into the depth charts when we're um, pulling out some of these guys. Um, so it was incredibly impressive and just such an unusual fixture to have your, your best international players available. And basically your guys who are really on the periphery earmarked for hopefully future stardom, but release the clubs, play a lot of kind of AIL, um, maybe on a few sub academy tra- uh, contracts. So it really was a, a mix of your your strongest and your look, not what, trying to be disrespectful, but your your weakest and what what you can do with that. So um, I definitely think a man you mentioned there has been hugely important. Has been Ian Costello and the fact that he's been he's monster through and through. Um, his his wife Louise would play with UL Bowes as well, and then he took he took off to England to try and further his career and strengthen his coaching um, his coaching badges and. For him to come back, but to have, I suppose, that connection with the club, that's a long-term one. I'm sure that was something that really helped in the last two weeks. Um, and I think it's really important as well that Munster made that decision, even when certain players and management might have been coming out of quarantine on the Sunday, that um, you know they were just going to go with who they could prepare with accurately in the, the two weeks leading up to the fixture once they knew, well, had a fair idea of what was played out in front of them. Um, and I think if you're a younger player coming into this setup. Like if you're a Daniel O'Keke, um or Scott Buckley, and you come in, and you're not sure yet, depending on how you train, whether you're going to be kicked out on the Sunday morning because you just weren't up to scratch, versus maybe given that uh, those assurances that guys, these spots are up for grabs for whichever one of you put your hand up the most, um, and you can line out alongside uh, Dave Cook in the front row or Peter O'Mahony. Um, I think that giving them that bit of confidence probably early on was important because it made them probably feel that they they were going to play some part as opposed to they were on trial, if you get what I'm saying. Mm. Um, so I think that was really important. And then it was just a typical monster performance. Like at times it was a bit like a sevens game there, particularly in that, that first half when um, when actually it was... Um, was that broke the broke the deadlock first? It was like a game seven's four, like no one took the the ball out, um, and it was kind of going to be a game where you weren't really going to be relying on overall defensive systems or um, trick plays. It was going to be like whoever reacts the most and commit the most, whatever the ball carrier decides to do, um, and that sheer heart and fighting grit and determination. And as a monster fan, it was just a class to watch. It was brilliant. Can I ask a question then about um, like identity and all that kind of stuff that feeds into Munster in particular? We had Raj on talking about how it's important that the players identify with where they're from. Uh, that was earlier in the week. Tony Ward is in the papers today saying, please let this be the end of cheap overseas imports coming in when we know this talent pool is there. I've, I've definitely had issues in the past with players moving between provinces. Like It has worked out mostly, you'd have to say, but they're it definitely dilutes a little bit the whole sense of place and who we are and where we're from. And particularly when you see that you can pick players from the sub academy and mix them in and they're this good. Like it definitely speaks to me about how we divide our talent and how much investment we need to make in the, the academy system in Connacht and Ulster and Munster in particular, it's really working. So let's double down on that as opposed to like taking players who are subs in Leinster and moving them around the country. Am I reading too much into this? Um, look, I do think we need to have a bit of context here. The Wasps had, um, well, they're obviously coming in with pretty bad form, but their team was completely, you know, they had a lot less time to maybe um, react to the the changes, the enforced changes that they had. I think they had five enforced changes, four on pitch and one on the field, or one on the bench, I should say, um, just before throw-in. So, like, this wasn't, we don't want to take away from the monster win, but I'm not, you know, there was a slight look at the draw that it was a, a maybe not a kind away fixture, but um, it was a team that were struggling and struggled with their own depth charts as well. Um, and the thing is that the kind of the emotion that would have been played out and the what Munster would have drawn on to get this performance, 
they wouldn't rely on week in, week out. You know, it was a very unique occasion. So I don't think you can say, you know, it was a schoolboy. It was it was dream stuff, but I don't think you can say week in, week out, you're going to pluck half a team or more than half a team, 12 members of a squad from the sub-academy and, and, and bring them in and get a win like that. I think he, that's a kind of a... And Peter Mahoney alluded to this as well. He said he's going to look back at this at retirement and and just really know how important, how special it was. Um, so it's it's not really something you fall back on, I guess. It was a real like, OK, we're going to squeeze every last inch out of this and use every bit of um, setback we got to try and, you know, put a positive spin in this. And they did that. But you can't do that week in, week out. Um, but it does show that we do have a lot of strength and depth there. And you, if you give guys opportunities, they are willing to step up and to take that. I mean, I think Patrick Campbell's try was incredible because <laughs> anyone else would be like, oh, that Keith Earls. We've got a, a, a three kind of be a tight two here, you know, the full back shifted out a bit on Earls. And I think most guys are probably still shifted and go, right, guys, you make the most of a 2v1. But he had the confidence straight and, and blitz through the line there is incredible. And that it comes from, as I say, probably the training paddock, the senior players, the Peter Manny's, the Keith Earls, and the Ian Costello's during in the two weeks saying, guys, you got to, you, you can't just shift it to the established guys. You got to be able to take your opportunity, and that's brilliant. And they they did that obviously really well in the preparation. Um, but still, I mean, if you were, you know, cheap imports, like you're not look at the likes of Damien Diarandi, but he's brought to Munster. He's been available. Obviously, his name and has been so so unlucky. Um, the likes of the CJ Stander, what he's done. We're not just going to. They were expensive imports. Come away. Uh, it's the, well, they were it's expensive the imports. Tier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. The next year down um, of players, like let's not go shopping for players who are going to be opportunity stoppers, I suppose, for the younger players. And that comes with an understanding too that like the coach's job shouldn't be dependent always on just what's happening today. That we're, we've got long term view, but I understand there's a tension there. Yeah, there is, and it's about kind of performances now and there's performances in the future so it's a, it's a constant juggling act um, because at the same time if you have if you know Jorn van Graan or um, you know Andy Friend turns around the end of the season and they say right guys you actually finished worse than last year and they say yeah but we we actually blooded this many new players well if you ask Connor supporters and Munster supporters or the, the board which they're happier with some might think long term but a lot of them be looking at well, actually, we're looking at performances at the moment. We need to win civil war at the moment. We need competitive training sessions at the moment. So it's a constant juggling act, and you're trying to raise standards, but also keep a pathway um, and opportunities for the guys that are coming through. And I suppose yesterday, it is certainly, or sorry, two days ago now, it's certainly a case for keeping the academy players, keeping the, the spots for them, um, and to try and maybe expose them a little bit more and a little bit earlier, but also it shows you know, the importance of RAAL and making sure that, that, like, releasing players there rather than having guys kept in academies training all the time, actual game time against seasoned amateurs, but guys who've been around the pitch a lot, like Tricky, if you are a front row to learn those kind of dark arts, how important it is that guys are getting game time as opposed to just training all the time. For sure. Uh, Louise, can I ask you about Connacht at the weekend? Like, I think in, in the build-up to that game, the build-up to the first week, obviously, of the competition, there was this constant theme of, can Connacht finally get out of the pool? Can they finally get to, to the knockout stages? And, like, it's 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 an ambitious enough target, for sure, but it's definitely something that you, you suspect that they could reach over the next couple of seasons. I, I'm not sure, though, in, in, in my microcosm, that the weekend's result is unbelievably impressive on that front because Stad came to town looking to bully them up front, and Connacht just had answers for that, like convincing answers to that, which would suggest that they're ready to, to win now, they're ready to, to, to get out of their, their pool at this stage and, and perhaps go where Connacht team hasn't gone before. Yeah, I think that's definitely what they're what they're targeting at the moment. And again, they would have had a bit of upheaval with that last training session, making a few changes. Um, so it doesn't seem to have deterred them. Um, it's just really good vibes coming out of the base with like Andy Friend just seems to have everyone saying off the same hymn sheet. Um, it's 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 class that they're playing in such a obviously sports ground like it's where you see a dry sunny day of a, of a rugby game out in the sports ground but they're still playing with such ambition and with trying to okay there wasn't a lot of pace the game the last day because it was almost impossible with the conditions but they're just trying to constantly change that point of attack um keep keep the tempo up 
and just add a bit of variety to the game. And like it was again, even it's important to them to see. Obviously, Matt Hansen had was, was a late withdrawal. Um, and we're not sure we'll see him this weekend, but good to see Porch and Wooten both get on the the score sheet as well because. What we have seen from this opening weekend is that it's the teams that are going to have the most flexibility, adaptability, guys that are ready to step in at any one moment because teams are changing at the drop of the hat. Um, and even who you're, you know, the likes of video analysis, who you're coming up against could change any minute because they could be, you know, felled by whatever COVID storm was being hit. Um, and, you know, that was a great reaction from Connor considering that they had those changes as well. Um, but obviously it'd be different with Kettle Fish going away to Leicester this weekend. Uh, Louise, we wanted to ask you about the refereeing situation, not just in rugby, but across multiple different sports, because you'll have seen at the weekend uh, a couple of instances, most notably in the Mount Belly Moylock Podrick Pierce's game on Saturday, where there was a pretty aggressive reaction to uh, Jerome Henry and his refereeing performance afterwards, where he had to be escorted off the pitch, uh, where he felt, I suspect, in a good deal of danger at the full time whistle. And as somebody who has seen both sides of the coin here with regards to the respect that is shown towards the referee in rugby and uh, the lack of respect or the perceived lack of respect that exists in Gaelic games, uh, we were just interested in getting your perspective on it. So, from your first hand experience is there a massive chasm between the two sports when it comes to the respect afforded to the officials oh absolutely there is yeah um and i was reflecting on this myself um because i was thinking do i change based on what sport i'm playing and even if i take three sports because i would have played an awful lot of um basketball as well and how you treat the the referee completely changes whether i'm playing ga which is the the most lax that basketball or rugby which is obviously the most um I suppose, protective of referees. And you know, even yesterday I was talking to them and they were saying like, why oh, the old ref knows if you have any contra- controversial decision, you don't blow up the game until you're near the dugout. And it's a kind of a, this is a GA ref, like it's kind of a joke, but it's also not because it's, it's he was telling the truth. Like if you're blowing it up and you know something's not gone, someone's not going to be happy at full time. He makes sure he, he's made sure he's near an exit and, at the same time, we need to kind of stamp that out. And look, I saw the instance, obviously, club players, it's huge what they put in all year. We're coming into December. Um, it's massive and they feel massively aggrieved, but you still have to have that respect. And it's not down to just uh, my body, my lock players. It's a total culture within the G. And it even comes back to, I think, the fact that the rules are so grey. Um it's they're very much open to interpretation at one stage. And the mark itself isn't in this particular incident, but I think the overall culture within the GA, whereas everything is so much more set and has a framework in, in rugby, but it badly needs to be stamped out. And as I say myself, like I know when I went started playing rugby, my first, I think, a seventh tournament down in Australia, I had two yellow cards in three games because I didn't give the ball back straight away. And it was a matter of like two to three seconds that I held onto the ball just considered that I stopped a quick tap, which is, you know, absolute no-no in sevens. Um, and I saw the same in twice in one day, which is obviously mortifying. It was like it was, my team had to play sixes instead of sevens when I was on the field. Um, and it, you learn the hard way. Uh, and then as soon as you go back playing rugby, you're like, you know, you can throw in an F or a blind and you, you're you stupid if you give the ball straight back after you, if you're in possession and you've given away free because it's accepted that you can, you know, berate the ref or argue against it for a certain amount of time and then they might move the ball up, which it might be worth it still if you're getting your defence set up, if you're on a bit of a break or an attack. Um, and it's it's just a complete culture shift. And as well, it's, it's down to even underage and how our whole officials parents, families, it's just a bit more accepted and unfortunately it's going to take a long time to, to stamp out and it may take a particularly poor incident. But I mean, who would want to be a referee in GA knowing that this is what you could be up against? Um, like you you can be just as aggrieved in a rugby game and a decision. Uh, it could be changed the whole outcome of the match. It could be two minutes from time, but you just can't react like that. And it's just accepted and it's in your head, it's ingrained in your head because you know these are the laws. It's just not accepted. So we need to get to a place where that's across all sports, really. Like Even in the Munster game on Sunday, just seeing the relatively controversial red card being met mm. with... Uh, 
not a shrug of the shoulders, but uh, a lot more acceptance than you might expect if it was a similarly controversial red card on a Gaelic Games field. Yeah, and as well, you can talk through, like, again, as was the slight grey area there as the mitigation was Dave Kilcoin dipping. Um, he had obviously had one tackler kind of around his legs that he was breaking at the time um, versus the, the force when um, Brad Shields did make contact with him. But even the fact that you, as a, as a spectator, can go, OK, you can go through this mitigation process, you can predict it, and then there might be a little bit of, I'm not sure what way the ref's going to read this. And I know, Jay, we don't have multiple cameras, we can't stop and have a TMO as well, but there is a little bit of, God, the ref could do anything here. And we do know we, like, this could be yellow, this could be black, this could be red. And that does lead to some of the issues, which is that the bit of looseness around a lot of the rules of the game, around simple things like steps over carrying, it's a little bit of interpretation on the day sometimes. Um, but I do think it's we have to work on our reaction because it's just it's not acceptable. And I mean, if you and the, the thing you have to really take it in, out of context is if you put that referee in the middle of the street and if those players went up and the first guy shoved him, the rest of them surrounded him, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? If it's not acceptable on the street, then it's not acceptable on the pitch. And I'm feel sorry for you that you lost, you know, I'm trying to find whatever I point. But this is just that's just the way it is. Yeah, for sure. Louise, great stuff this morning. Thanks a million for joining us. Thanks, guys. Louise Galvin there on the line with us this morning. It is 8.31. OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Uh, shall we go through some of the sports pages? I think we will. Let's have a look at otbsports.com this morning. Nevin on Aubameyang. Arsenal fans are fed up with guys not doing the work. Minister seek IRFU meeting following letter from 62 players is the headline there on the rugby story. Sharp Rise reported in Premier League COVID-19 cases. One game falling victim to that already this week. Manchester United versus Brentford is off. IRFU refutes claims of untrustworthy leadership from players. And Leinster's Montpellier trip in doubt as both clubs endure COVID outbreaks. So COVID is going to cause havoc on your uh, midweek and weekend sports watching, it turns out, this week. Just a reminder of uh, some of the back pages. We've already brought you through some of these, but we'll run through them again. The Irish Independent leads that IRFU story. IRFU hauled in over women's row. Government demand meeting after current and former players lose trust in the union. Managing the breakdown, IRFU rejects criticism from players as crisis hits Irish women's rugby. The Irish Times, uh, current and former Ireland players express loss of trust and faith in the IRFU. Got that Johnny Waterson piece that I mentioned as well. And uh, Jerry Thornley goes with uh, an angle on Munster. Sometimes less coaching can mean more expression. And that certainly seems to be the case at the Rico on Sunday. The back of the mirror. What a balls up is their headline. Technical problem blamed as first last 16 draw has to be scrapped. Also, uh, Georgie says, I'm away. Georgie Kelly has informed Bowes and Derry City that he won't be staying in the League of Ireland next season. And Sligo Rovers rising star Johnny Kenny is also a flight risk amid mounting interest in the talented teenager from the Premier League and from the top flight in Scotland. Andre Arshavin really struggled with the balls, didn't he? It's like he couldn't get them open for ages. Yeah. Yeah, he did actually. But they're hard. they looked like hard balls to open. I don't know. I think maybe you just kind of realise that there's a little bit in the middle that you do one one way and the other the other way and you twist. It's like a little twisting motion. I thought maybe... Andre would have worked it out, but he was such an instinctive footballer. Everything came naturally to him. He didn't need to think about things. No, no. I'd say just don't knock it till you try it, to be honest, or like don't knock how hard it is until you try it. There, but for the grace of the football gods, go we. Like, I mean, exactly. Like, we, we, we often criticise footballers for, for basic errors, and we don't have an appreciation of just how much talent it takes to actually achieve at that level. I think the same goes for being involved in the Champions League draw. We have no appreciation just how hard it is to open those balls. It was it was a good point that Daniel made about how uh, how much of a shit show everything has been this week. <laughs> like, <laughs> we expect these massive multi billion dollar organizations to be able to run things smoothly, and it turns out they can't. Everybody is faking it, Owen. Everybody is faking it. Is this part of your like sports entertainment bashing that yesterday was just a, a mode of entertainment for UEFA? Uh, what, what, what was the uh, ESPN meaning? So uh, ESPN Entertainment and Sports Programming Network. Oh, that, 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 that's they, your you you were sitting on that they, for the last twenty four hours, chewing on that after they the, knew the crack, right? Yeah, like I mean, but what else? What, what else is there? 
Ger, of course. For anybody who wasn't with us yesterday, Ger watches sport for the rules and fairness and for everything to be to be proper and everything <laughs> for to be... sport. For a competition to happen and for everybody to know what the rules are at the start of the competition, that seems like a fairly basic tenet of sporting excellence. Ger doesn't like fun, everybody. That's that's the bottom line <laughs> here. He 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 wants to call it SPN. He 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 would write to them immediately and say, "Please change your name to SPM because he hates fun and he hates probably hates Christmas, even despite the no. fact that he's got a Christmas tree what? over his shoulder. Just doesn't like nice things, and that's fine too." Um, I do think that what they should have done, what the lesson from the Formula One was, and I know very little about this at all because I, I stopped watching Formula One like when the Jordans left, or even before that. Uh, like it sounded like the rules were bad. And instead of saying we're going to change the rules on the spot, they should have come out and said, look, we're really, it's really unfortunate that that's the way this ended. But what we're going to do is learn from this and change the rules for next season so that the races can't finish with the safety car out there, which, like, it seems like it's a fairly stupid rule. It's, it's, say, for example, they had applied the rules yesterday. Everybody would have been saying Max Verstappen was robbed of the opportunity to win the race. Because they would have said that the race finished with the safety car. And there would have been an outcry, a smaller outcry, but an outcry, you know, nonetheless, obviously less of an outcry in this part of the world because we were fed a diet of the UK papers. But would that have been fair? It wouldn't really. Like, uh, my point is the rules were bad and they were badly applied in this instance. You still think that, like, they, this is great because they concocted a little bit of drama. You're a Jake Paul. You're, you think Jake Paul is the saviour of boxing. <laughs> like, t- tell me why I'm wrong. He is uh, single-handedly taking that sport to a whole new stratosphere. Um, just for no, I, I don't genuinely think that. But like, I, 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 you're you're obviously turning this you into a, a far bit, more black and white uh, <laughs> situation than, than it needs to be. Uh, I I I think you know he's uh, he's in, he's entitled to. He's entitled. Jake Paul's entitled to do what he wants with his boxing career. Michael Massey's entitled to do with his race. It's his race, his ball, and he's picking it up and he's going home. If Max Verstappen can't kick the golden goal. And you know what? I respect. I respect him. It. I respect him for that. And I would do something similar if I was in his position. What? So can I just? Can I, one, 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 people are saying like, "What's the outcome going to be here? It's going to be decided in court." Why don't they just have like a ten-lap race off? Or get Judge Judy in to do the court case and make that an entertaining spectacle. Move it to a jurisdiction where you're allowed to film the court cases and just blow this thing up. Ten-lap race wouldn't be bad either, though. In a go kart, I mean, just the same go, or, or just put them both into a Haas car. Put, put put them both into the, to the worst Formula 1 car available and let them race 10 laps and see who the best driver is at that point. That should, that should be the mode of tiebreakers for Formula 1. Put them into the same car and see who wins. Or just do qualifying again or something like that. I don't know. He's on the back of the Irish Daily Star, by the way. Hamilton says, Farce finale was rigged. So if you were tweeting on Ooh, Sunday being like, God, he's so gracious. So gracious. It's not it was, rigged, is it? Uh, it wasn't well, rigged. It wasn't rigged. It, like, that, he that, still had the opportunity to defend his... He could have defended his racing line in the last lap a bit more. Like, you know, he still had to lose the last lap. He was quoted from saying in race radio, which wasn't actually broadcast at the time, this has been manipulated, man. Uh, like, I mean, I still think he did pretty well to, to keep it cool in the aftermath. My sense was though that there was nothing that he could do and there was certainly no benefit to him raging in the post race interview that he was like the lawyers are going to sort this out the the, the, the lawyers are going to uh, f- fix this and and uh, and everything will be fine in the end what I found very very telling about Hamilton was just the dead silence afterwards where he just sat in the car you know, you know the, the Pablo Escobar Narcos meme where he's just sitting and staring into the middle distance for a while that, that was Lewis Hamilton for about five minutes just staring through his helmet and just wondering what what had just uh, what had just happened and I was kind of waiting for an explosion afterwards then because he would have been right and I would have been, I would have had absolute sympathy for him to to have been fuming in the aftermath but he didn't he he didn't he didn't choose that avenue but he did say this has been manipulated uh, into the race radio at the time um the main headline there in the back of the star by the way is oh balls euro draw descends into farce Andrew Arshman I think is getting a hard time Ger. Like I mean, you. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't him. It was the guy beside him, right? No, I know, but like you criticised his ball opening skills, and he's well, the he he's the man the who's who's photographed on the back of all the papers. Andrey Arshavin. Yeah. I mean, he is in danger. You love him, do you? He, scoring four goals and not winning a game of football it ha- is in danger of being usurped by <laughs> what he did yesterday. Uh, I also expected everybody to have like slightly better manicured nails. They the bad cuticle action going on for all. Yeah. Of them. 
I was like, come on, lads. Yeah, it's, has, no one, has no one taught you to push back the little bit of skin at the top of your finger? Come on. <laughs> a little nail file? No? You're going on telly, like literally tens of, if not hundreds of millions of people. I'd like to apologise for the nail shaming that's going on this morning on OTB and we welcome uh, No, it's fine it's, it's making us crime on I mean Andre Arshavin and the, the other guys the I other... think Ar- Arshavin's nails actually look okay on this Were they okay? Yeah, they, Ar- Arshavin looks fine I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just here to defend Andre Arshavin for the, the level of standard you, I, this, The love for Andre Arshavin coming out here right now is um, top notch It is I mean, I, lo- I love this man uh, shut down fear is the is the back of the Irish Daily Mail. This is to do this is with the Premier League teams worrying that spiraling COVID cases could halt the season. I'll uh, just quickly run through some of the back pages. The rest of them, uh, United tried to put game off. Is the back of the Heralds. They're leading with uh, last night's news. Really, since that has been has gone to the printers, it has been confirmed that that game is off. There's an exclusive in the Sun with Bryony e. Frost. No one should be treated how how I was. Phil Thomas has sat down with her. Speaking up was my only way to stop bullying. Uh, at the back of the London Times is UEFA farce as European draw rerun. And Wolf told me, I deserve title. That's Max Verstappen who said Toto Wolf said he deserved to win the title. And back page of the Guardian, mounting threat. Premier League announces record 42 positive cases. And then finally, the Telegraph leads with a picture of poor Andrew Arshavin. But the main story is that Hamilton claims title showdown manipulated to suit Verstappen. So those are uh, the back pages this morning. John Duggan is with us in studio at 8.41. How are you, John? Good, I want to enjoy yourselves. Yeah, good. There's plenty happening. Uh, like There's a good eclectic mix of stories in the back pages there. What, what are you looking at? What's what's leading the agenda for you? Uh, well, what's leading the agenda is obviously this nuclear war now yeah. between the uh, Irish Rugby Football Union and the women's rugby players. 62 of them writing to the government effectively asking them to intervene about how the sports run in the country. Rock bottom for relations between the bodies. 2014, fourth in the world. 2013, Six Nations Grand Slam to a situation where they're losing to Spain and not qualifying for World Cup. The Sevens game, they didn't qualify for the Olympics. Should there even be a Sevens programme? Are there enough of a pool of players for that to even happen? And the RFU responding with their own statement, which has been criticised in some quarters, they criticise the tenor and timing of this uh, communique from the players to the government when there are two independent reviews going on into A, the World Cup failure, B, the way the sport is uh, run in the country. The issue I have with that is that these reviews are being commissioned by the RFU. They see the reviews and they don't have to publish them and they will not be publishing them. They're only going to publish key findings. It feels that the breakdown of relations has got to such a... Uh, Cold War situation that for the for the players to go to the government and bring Catherine Martin and Jack Chambers into this who are obviously now jumping all over it having given the RFU 18 million euro in grant money yesterday yep. as taxpayers money uh, it has really got to a stage where this is really stark for the RFU who have to be called in now to explain themselves about how they're running the, the game to me it, it, it's it's the, what's, the pa- what's the plan what's the pathway and it doesn't seem that there is a transparent pathway about the the running of the women's game from what the players have said. It, it, it does it kind of speak to maybe a, a wider problem in the organisation even does does it have does it have to come to a point where these reports regardless of whether it's the men's or the women's game just need to be published and that that, that is kind of like a first step because in fairness so like and I know we've spoken a lot about this on the show Jerry as well that like the, when you get to like the every four years uh, review of why Ireland got knocked out in the World Cup quarter final in the, in the men's game there is a report that is carried out but isn't fully published like does that need to change is that one of the first things that needs to change here that when there are when there's work carried out to find out the failings in the men's or the women's game that actually the public know about it because as you say John there's now a bit of a uh, bit of extra taxpayers money going into this organisation maybe don't fail so a, fa- a failure free zone and never and maybe, then... maybe maybe put better plans in place so you don't have to analyse why your plans got screwed up in the first place mm. would that not be right Sorry, John, go on ahead. Give us your thoughts on that. Cause I'm, I'm, I, 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 was I just, don't know. I was just coming to my head, do we need an ombudsman or woman for sport in the country if this taxpayer's money going to these organisations? Like Irish boxing, for example, is a sport that has had serious issues around uh, the, the smoothness of its governance, you'd have to say, in, in, in recent times. Uh, like the way GA money is spent, for example, on, on, on developments like Porky Cueve 
um, the accountability around that if there's 30 million going to it. Do we need some kind of independent, I don't know, function of the state to almost do a sweep of organisations around what they're doing if they're taking public funds, including horse racing, greyhound racing, all that kind of thing, um, uh, from a transparency point of view, that might not be a bad thing. Isn't that, I would argue, Sport Ireland's function? And maybe we need to beef up the statutory powers of Sport Ireland. Yeah. And if you're getting any grant money, then you need to sign up. But like, I made this point a little bit earlier on. The IRFU have singularly failed to reach the number of women, the, the gender quotas that were outlined, that they signed up to and agreed to. The, the last figures that I've seen were for March, and they were at 8% at that point. Maybe they've hit the 30% in the intervening eight months, but it certainly doesn't seem like they have because none of the actions over the last period of time suggest an organization that understands the role of the uh, the growth potential for the women's game, uh, how women are supposed to be treated within the sport. It just seems like it's an organization that just doesn't really fully understand what's happened to it. And it's interesting too, this is a, a, a huge moment for them. Philip Brown's supposed to finish up in two weeks' time. This is like, you know, his Christmas holidays must be due to kick in uh, fairly soon and this is going to be the very end of his uh, time in charge of the IRFU so I, I don't know who the, the new CEO is going to be or who the acting CEO is going to be or what the, the role is at that point but like a big opportunity for whoever comes in to usher in a, a, a clean sweep and a new broom but I think you're, you're dead right John somebody needs to be fully holding these organisations to account because of the amount of public money that they get and that's the key thing Remember the Billy Walsh case one of our greatest ever coaches had, was let go to go to the United States and Sport Ireland and I think the, the state, they all wanted to give him a deal and it just the politics of it didn't work out. I remember calling it leprechaunism at the time um, and a member of Sport Ireland, I think they said that they their confidence was shaken in, in, in the administration of boxing. But what actually happened mm. after that? Nothing. Nothing. And... To be honest, like I, I, I do wonder as well. Like, and I kind because of, you always get this argument: oh, well, you're actually you're hurting the you're hurting the sports people if you take away funding. And and it, sometimes I think that success can cover up those sort of failings as well. Like you'd have to say that the Tokyo Games were much more successful. Well, no question about it. it. It is a fact that the Tokyo Games were a much more successful Olympics for Irish boxing than Rio was. So there could be a picture painted in the aftermath of that. That you know. Everything is on the right track. Everything has been sorted. The Billy Walsh scandal, remember that? Yeah, we, everything has fixed since then. And of course, things have got better, but have things actually been mended properly? Have things been done in all the right ways since then? And I think that looking at the medals and looking at the success is, is the wrong way to do uh, to do that. And that kind of made me like do uh, just kind of be a little bit hesitant to compare the IRFU even to maybe the, the women's football team here at the moment because, yes, they're on a successful run at the moment, but just because the... Uh, the visible part of the duck is tranquil and everything is, is going quite well doesn't mean that what's going on under the surface is going very well either and unfortunately from Irish Rugby's perspective it has been the performances on the pitch that have sparked this series of events that have allowed everybody to look a little bit deeper under the surface and I wonder in over a period of time in a perverse way will people be thankful that actually the, the bad results happened and that actually it, it forced a, a real rethink about how women's rugby was operating in this country? Well, rightly now, there's much more attention and scrutiny and care given to women's sport because if you look at um, the Sportswoman of the Year Awards this week, uh, it's been the year of the woman because, and you know, and gender really shouldn't be relevant, but like all the main achievements in our sport this year have been from women. Kelly Harrington, Leon Maguire, Ellen Keane, Rachel Blackmore, the Meath ladies. You go on and on. And... Uh, we're giving more coverage to the women's soccer team. Sky are sponsoring them. Cadbury's are sponsoring them. They're seen as a great brand. Thankfully, it seems Stephen Kenny will get a contract because we know that the men's team is, is actually a good brand right now. So I do think like from tracksuit gate to there, you can see what can happen in a good way. And hopefully whoever's coming in the RFU, um, CEO-wise, can bring the women's game from this nuclear standoff to a better place mm. where there's a pathway. How do we get more people into the pool is it through? Do we need a better AIL? What's the situation with the provinces? And can we get these girls to be playing more games? Because, the, you know, going to World Cups, even though there might be a lot of funding, there might be a lot of support around the actual tournament itself, what is the day-to-day -day and the week-to-week -week so they can improve their skills and be competitive again vis-a-vis -vis England and France? 
Can we talk to John about um, Lewis Hamilton? Because uh, yeah. there's a culture war ongoing in the OTB AM team here. Owen thinks what happened at the weekend was brilliant, great TV, high drama. That's amazing. That's all you want of a Sunday afternoon sitting eating your popcorn and and arguably fair and and, and, and uh, arguably getting fair. high on, on the on the sugar. And um, I'm making the point that like it's a shit show. Uh, well, let's hear what Lewis Hamilton said on the final lap of that race. And let's hear now what Max Verstappen said yesterday. Of course, it helps that you already have seven titles. I think that comforts him a bit. Yeah, it would have. I think if it's the other way around, it would be more painful, you know, for me because I, I don't, I didn't have one. So, uh, but you know, Lewis is a great sportsman in general. He, you know, he came up to me and congratulated me, and it must have been, of course, you know, very tough in that last lap. Um, but yeah, it also shows the respect, you know, we have for each other in general. Of course, we had our tough times throughout the season, but at the end, you know, we respect what, what we were doing and we were pushing each other, to, you know, to the limit the, the whole season. So it, it has been really enjoyable, you know, racing against them. It was fantastic entertainment, but I feel that Lewis Hamilton is the most unlucky person I've ever seen in sport. He was the best driver in Abu Dhabi. And you could know that from the very first moment of the race when he outsmarted Verstappen and had a better start than Verstappen uh, uh, off the grid when he wasn't first. He's 12 seconds ahead of Verstappen. How is it fair when he's got the race in the bag that he can't change tyres, that Verstappen can change tyres and be right behind him and then Lewis Hamilton's a sitting duck when uh, all the back markers between them were allowed to unlap uh, but the rest of the cars weren't allowed to unlap because if that had happened the safety car would have just taken it to the end it is a wacky race a solution that even dastardly and mutley could not have dreamed of uh it's net is it dastardly and mutley owen oh i'm, I'm a big fan of dastardly and mutley they used to be on tg car in the early 2000s <laughs> okay so okay, uh, they, yeah. um it's the netflixization of sport you cannot argue it's the most one of the most dramatic uh, entertainment things i've ever seen in sport but i don't know about the fairness of it and that's why i look at sport i'm a one nil to the arsenal kind of guy i'm into the rules and to me this seems too cloudy i see you see that that there you go it is cloudy that is that is it. No, nobody can tell me for sure that what happened to Lewis Hamilton was a complete travesty of justice, and that he has been properly thrown under the bus like of entertainment one. here. It kind of feels feel like, like one. Maybe it maybe but, feels but, like but, one, but, but it feeling like one is is not good enough. It's not acceptable for it to feel like that. It doesn't. It's not right. Lewis Hamilton. Everything went against him, and to be like, it's, I don't blame Max Verstappen or Christian Horner. They were just uh, doing what they were told, but. All of, every single thing went against Lewis Hamilton. That, and I, that doesn't seem right. How can you be 12 seconds ahead to have the guy right behind you for one lap of like a black ball finish where the referee puts the black ball on the spot and says, okay, lads, forget about what's ever happened before. It just seems to me it's Netflixization. Next, next call a winner. That was a great one. Somebody said it's like, it's 4 nil, 89 minutes on the clock and then the ref picks up the ball and goes, next call the winner. You're like, all right, cool. I mean, you know. Like the, the drive, everybody knows. Like this, the drive to survive is going to be absolutely sensational, and everybody will be. It's it's they, they've done an amazing job in that regard. But I just, I, I, why couldn't they just let the, the 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 race come out to the end of with the safety car to the end uh, and and let it finish that way? Because I think that would have been the fair outcome. It would have been outcome. embarrassing for them. I well, how would, would have been embarrassing? Been, well, how would have well, been embarrassing? Because, he, because everybody's watching and everybody's like, "Hang on, can you?" Here's the thing. This is this is an organization who during the year got everybody to go to spa, the rains came, and then they were like, oh, no, that was a race. Even though we only had three laps, you can't have your money back. Like, it's not, this is not like a paradigm of well-run sporting goodness. This is like, this is as as weird and dysfunctional uh, multi-national uh, sports organization as FIFA, as UEFA, as the IOC. It just, this is their moment to shine. Sports mm. administrators screwing up and shining and everybody finally is like oh because what happened in spa was just like just as egregious right th th i mean i can't even remember but shane would tell us yeah. points were awarded on the basis of that race doesn't make any sense and i think it would have been embarrassing for the sport for people the the new watchers on who don't tune in all the time going why did the safety car come in how does the race over behind the the, the little mercedes just won the whole thing because it would have how been it would have been sporting rules correctly applied Sure, sure, but like I think that I think that everybody would have gone. These rules don't make any sense, and that, that's and I think what they were trying to do is to prevent that, to prevent the embarrassment. What they did was they 
they applied rules that nobody seems to fully understand that are totally opaque. And as a result, everybody's going, what the hell is this? I, I, so all I know a situation worse. All I know is that there is a very black and white rule in there, and that is that the race director can do what the hell he likes. And the race director <laughs> did what the hell he liked on Sunday. So the rules have been applied by, and entertainment has come to the fore as well. It's a win-win-win. I see absolutely nothing wrong with this. The game stay the game. There's about 100 memes going through my head at the moment. It's like your man, Inspector Gadget, with the cat. Um, that you never see uh, that's just deciding everything uh, and the other one was going through my head was Trading Places you don't know if you ever seen that movie Trading Places uh, with John, uh, Eddie Murphy and is, uh, is Trading Places a Christmas movie? it is with Dan Aykroyd and, uh, and, uh, Controversial and, take. And, and, and Eddie Murphy where your man is going at the end Mortimer he's one of the Dukes and they've, they've been done out of all their money he's just going uh, bring those brokers back in here turn those machines back on and it's like that's what like, Toto Wolf was like no Michael no um, and it was a bit like that and they can't go to the court of arbitration for sport apparently the only people they can appeal to is an, an independent FIA panel so that's what's going to happen oh, now so, so, okay, I didn't know so that. Martin right. Samuel is writing about that today in the mail and what's going to happen now is I think like to be fair Lewis Hamilton was brilliant after the race he was such a uh, class and then Max Verstappen says correctly that if you won seven world titles it helps but it actually will motivate Lewis Hamilton if I was Lewis Hamilton I'd be so gunning for next year yeah. to win that eighth yeah. world title and that will bring the entertainment value Back to, uh, back to next week. Win, win, win. Yeah. Almost time. right. For sure. John Duggan. All right, lads. Great stuff this morning. Thanks, many for being with us. Uh, it is 8.55 on this Tuesday morning. You're with us here on OTB AM. It's brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Right. Uh, we are turning our attention uh, to the athletics this weekend because at the European Cross Country Championship, Ireland had uh, gold in the under 23s. Uh, Keelan Kilrehel finished sixth and he was part of the team who helped the team uh, win that. And he's with us now this morning. Keelan, good morning to you. Hello, how are you keeping? Yeah, very well. Congratulations, first of all. Uh, I guess mm. this uh, it was just such an unbelievable result. It was an unbelievable day for Irish cross country. When did you realise that you were going to be in with a shout of team gold uh, during the race? Uh, I suppose, I suppose during the race, I still wasn't really thinking of a team goal. I suppose like you're trying to just get to the end of it yourself. But I kind of, I knew at one stage probably the only one I can highlight really is like when I went by, I went by two GB lads that that they were there second and third scores and I was like, I'm going by them two, Dara's up there as well. So I'm like, geez, we, they're, they were half favourites to win it. So I was like, if I'm going by them two, we should be up there in the team. But at the same time, you, you try not to think about that during the race, you're just trying to get to the end of it. When you're chasing people down, how big a factor is it that you're actually racing at home and that there is a massive crowd out there in Abbottstown? Yeah, because I sense uh, to a few people as well, like, uh, it was all about beforehand, nearly not letting the crowd affected the start and just being relaxed and patient because you could get very excited as well. But like, I think I was like, yeah, the last lap in the home straight, like having that, having the crowd definitely helped. Cause it was, uh, I'd say it was, it was the loudest and biggest crowd with your cross, I'd say there was ever like, so no, it's massive. There's this great uh, video and there's images as well of you after crossing the finish line, the stewards have a hold of you basically trying to say, <laughs> get out of the way for everybody coming through. And you're like, no, get away from me. I want to hug my teammate. <laughs> that really summed up, I guess, the spirit that exists in your team. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. Because like, uh, <laughs> I got up, I was wrecked, and I know where I got the energy from, but I was able to sprint over to power. But yeah, I suppose you just know these guys for years. Like, and I'm, like they're my best friends, even outside running and so, stuff. So, yeah, it's just like growing up and racing with them for years and then just to be able to win a goal with them, yeah, it's, it's unreal, like. Because that's what's really interesting is that it is at at a base level an individual sport. But the reason why you were all on the, the front pages of the sports sections yesterday is because of, of the team spirit. So has that been something that, that you've fostered over the last couple of years to try and look at this in a collective sense as much as focusing on yourself and you, and your own individual progress? Yeah, I suppose cross country is always a bit like that, especially European level. Like it's probably, if you say a team is just as big as anything and like, it's kind of weird to run because like everything's so individual, but you do get these championships and like you just spend the whole weekend with your team and like it's really just all about how your team can do and like no one's talking about themselves really. It's mostly just like how we can help the team and yeah, it's like no, it's really nice. Yeah. Was there an expectation, Keelan, that this would be a really successful meet for Ireland? Yeah, definitely. Like I suppose I don't know if people thought our team was really like the one that would win gold. Like I know, like there was like Ireland sent a very strong team this time because like. Everyone was coming home for national stuff because, like, Wednesday night, and everyone wanted to be there. People were flying home, and like, it was just mad. But, like, the expectation on ourselves, we kind of said, like, if we can get a medal, if we can get just under that 40 points, we get a medal. I'm just, we're nearly looking at bronze, which is anything. But, 
yeah, we've seen Cole come up. I don't think any of us knew what to do. <laughs> and, and what did he do in the Ashman? How did he celebrate it? Uh, we went back to the hotel there. Like, uh, I suppose it's kind of hard these days to properly celebrate, but you can still enjoy it. Like. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Keelan, your, your own story is, is fascinating. You're, you're somebody who people might be familiar with from... I suppose about six years ago. Can, can you take us back to, to 2015 when, I'm not sure what age you were, but you were about to run in the Community Games National Finals and you had a bad bike accident. Can you take us back to that summer of 2015 and and tell us what happened? Um, yeah, I suppose I'll try to keep it short in a way, but uh, yeah, so that year, like uh, I was just going out on my bike. It was really, I suppose it was half a mile from my house and uh yeah, I suppose uh, young and foolish. I just uh, I was flying down this hill that uh, shouldn't have been gone down, and uh, yeah, I came to the bottom. And I met a car, but I didn't actually hit the car because I, I got such a fright when I seen it that I just hit hit the brakes, and I went flying out over the handlebars, anyways. And yeah, after that, it was lights out, and yeah, so I suppose that put me out for a while. I had I had like three broken vertebrae in my back, and then uh, a fracture in my neck as well, so I'd have a a brace bone. Yeah, I was on that for six weeks, but. Like a kind of, at a time where, at a time you don't take it serious, I suppose that the first thing I was asking about, even after the operation, was just when can I get back to football, when can I get back to running? Like, you kind of, it does make it easier when it's that age. You just, you kind of, you don't realize the seriousness and you just, yeah, you just get back at it. Because I was reading up on that yesterday and it, and it did seem remarkable how your first reaction to it once you're in hospital, because you get brought to Crumlin at, at that point, is, is how do I get back? Mm-hmm. How, how do I get back running? How do I get back? playing sport because you were playing a number of different sports at the time but the prognosis could have been quite serious and it was quite serious at, at that point Keelan there, there seemed to be almost a, a beautiful ignorance in your own head about about what could have happened in, in that moment yeah exactly that was it like this, I suppose yeah the first time it came to my realisation was like after surgery and the surgeon came in and I was like uh, my first question was to him uh, just when can I go back to football and like he was just like hey he kind of smiled and laughed and he was like this should be the last thing from your head and like yeah, that was the first time I was top up upset about it. But yeah, because like even a, even a week later, I probably shouldn't be saying this as well. But uh, I hopped in the I hopped in the stationary bike at home because I was afraid to lose the fitness of what I'd done over the last two years. So that's just yeah, I know it's probably just a bit nuts, like, but yeah, it's just your mindset at the time. And when they're telling you, yeah, going back in a few weeks, uh, probably not a good idea. Like, is there a tone to that, Keelan, where they're like? Listen, we don't know what you'll be able to do in the long run, never mind in three to six weeks. Yeah, definitely. Like, definitely, yeah. I suppose I suppose the one really said that to me there at the time, because, like, I was going back to my coach home, Philip, that uh, oh, I'd back to him four weeks training now. Just <laughs> and uh, he kind of smiled and laughed at me because he didn't want to break to me that, you know, this isn't going to be just four weeks. Like, you're going to, it's not just better getting the brace off and stuff and you're fine. Like, this is, it's take a lot of physio and like, it'll take a lot more work than that. But, I suppose it did only, like, run-wise, it did only take three months to get back. But it's just, I just had to be careful, I suppose, not to hit my back while it was, because it was still broken, like, so I couldn't really, yeah, I still had to be wary of it. How, how close did you come, do you know, to, to life-changing injuries? Um, Yeah, very close, I suppose. <laughs> uh, like, my back probably wasn't a big problem, even though everyone thinks that, like, there was a, it was a C1 fracture in my neck and, uh, they said if that was broken, it was it was like that. I'd never, I'd never walk, maybe never talk again. So, yeah, it's kind of weird even saying that, but yeah, you just never really. I suppose there's nothing in the bad side of it. I suppose you think I'm all right now. Yeah, I can't really complain. I can only imagine. I'm not sure if you like spoken to your family even in the in the aftermath of that. As a couple of years have passed, and you've got back to back to I guess continuing on an unbelievable trajectory of, of success sporting wise have, have you spoken to your family about the, the worries that they had at the time because I'd imagine from their perspective it was a, a fairly traumatic experience as well oh definitely yeah. I know they were a lot more worried than I was but especially mum she's worrying about me at the best times but yeah the last thing they were thinking about was sport as well they just wanted to see me home and <laughs> talking and walking like. but uh, yeah I think they took the brunt of it as well because the surgeon would come and tell them what was happening but yeah it was a weird time and when you did get back Keelan what was that actually like what was that sense of being back and, and being able to run again and, and do other things yeah it was class because like I was just getting so sick at home because I was home I meant because I was meant to take four weeks off school as well and I think I only took three because I was like oh mum I'm going daft here can I just go back to school I never thought I'd say it but uh, 
yeah, I know that first run back was class because it's just, yeah, like, you're just, like, just sitting on the couch, like, not being able to play football with the lads and stuff, it just didn't suit me. Because, like, even the odd time I was, I was caught playing football and I shouldn't have been because, like, I was back running, so I felt, oh, I'm fine. But then I'd hop into a five side with the lads, and, like, just outside and everyone roaring at me to cop on, get back, because if I got hit in my back at all, like, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was stupid at the time, but you just, uh, you say it's too tempting. And did you go back playing everything afterwards? Like, did you go back playing football properly? Because you were, it, it was Gaelic and soccer you were playing up to that, was it? Yeah, yeah. So, I, like, at the time, I was just, I was stuck in everything. Like, I'd heard in football, soccer, running. But, like, I got back running first. And then, like, when my back fully healed, I think it was, like, seven months there, I got back playing football then. I just went back to training with them. And, yeah, so I surely got back into playing matches. So, it didn't really take too long in the end. Right. So, when did you specialise? When did you decide running is going to be the thing for me? Oh, I suppose, I suppose I got to 15 and 16 and like, like training starts getting a bit more intense and you're like, like stuff are clashing and you're like, I was like, you kind of, it just happened naturally in a way. Like I didn't really, it wasn't a big decision. I didn't have a big sit down about it. I just knew myself like, like running has a lot more opportunities for me like than, than any other sport. Like I'd obviously have loved to be in Premier League football, like, but this is kind of, yeah, what it was what I was kind of most held in and what I, the biggest opportunity. So it was fairly, fairly easy choice then. Because like, it's not just a sense in 2015 that you were going to compete in the nationals in community games. It was a sense that you were going there to win. And I think you, you do go there the following summer then and actually get gold, right? So this, this was clearly the sport yeah. that you could look at and say, I can be one of the best in the country at. Yeah, definitely. I suppose I was only starting now as well and just, like when you get that big success at all, I don't know if you're like, well, if I could stick out this training wise and actually, like, because like, some of these ads would have a bit of a jump in as well, like, if I could just get a few years of training here, God knows all you can do, I suppose. And yeah, it's kind of, yeah, haven't we looked back since, I suppose. When did you realise that it was going to be something that could lead to a moment like Sunday, where you thought to yourself that actually winning a, a, a European medal actually could be could become a reality? Yeah, I suppose I probably definitely didn't think it would be Sunday. Mm. Um, like I knew the realistic chance of doing well, like and like even I suppose in the hotel room night before, like and stuff like we were like, yeah, kind of like if we can get one of us into top five, we're like looking at Dara, he's he's definitely should be top five. Me and Power just like if we can come two of us top fifteen, like we have a good chance of a medal. And like I said, top fifteen is definitely realistic, but it's still be a good result. But yeah, I just didn't expect to come sixth uh, this early in my career, anyways. To be honest, yeah. It's been a, a relatively interesting year for, from your own perspective as well this year because I know you were out in Kenya training with a couple of the other lads who were part yeah. of the team on Sunday. Yeah. Can, can you talk us through that experience and and I guess the, the idea behind going down there and what you actually got up to? Yeah, like that's it was kind of just once in a lifetime stuff because like especially at the start it was just it's just such a different world. But um, yeah, I went with Dara, McLennie and Jamie Battle. They're both lads in the team and both lads they've known for a long time, but. Yeah, I suppose he, Derek kind of was the one who said to me in November because he had gone the year before and I'd always said, right, I'll go with, definitely go with you next year. But like he kind of mentioned to me in November, I didn't think it was an option because with all those going on with COVID, but I kind of just said, yeah, sure, why not? We'll we'll go and like hope for the best of golf advice that we'll get be able to go for and stuff. But yeah, I think the three of us had the best five weeks of our life out there. And like just training wise, it just helps so much. It's just, it's all you have to worry about there. And like when you come down from attitude, then like, like me and Jamie probably didn't get the chance to prove that it worked, but like Dara came back and he ran seven fifty mm-hmm. for three K and ran national records like and stuff. Like it definitely it's as much the environment you're in as the attitude, but yeah, the three of us definitely kinda of push each other on. What what was the environment like then? If if it's as much to do with that as the attitude? Yeah, so like it's just it's just so routine, like like you just don't even think about it. Like it's just up at seven every morning, go get breakfast, go train, come back, sleep, eat, go get, go train again. And like you leave the, I know probably if we, we're going again actually in two weeks' time, but like, I suppose you're sitting and having breakfast with some of the world's best, like, and like you walk to the top of the road and you just see the Olympic champion or, or European champion in Mumbai, and you just, yeah, it's it's a weird, like, weird, but like, yeah, it's definitely, it's eye open. How much does that bring you on, being able to train and even exist in the same sphere as people who have one at the very top level to, I guess it's it's great that because I, I know you're on a scholarship in DCU and and the athletics program there is excellent. But to be able to remove yourself from that, go into an international stage and train there with the world's best for a while, I presume that just brings your levels up to to a whole new level. Oh, definitely. Yeah, just like just looking and like talking to them, like it's just yeah, it's very eye opening. Like, but at the same time, we kind of all came back saying like, you know, I just we'd love that to be us. Like, 
And he was like, yeah, like you said, like you think it's like, oh no, that's so unrealistic. But like at the same time, like they're, they have two legs as well, kind of like, and you're like, some of them just like, it's just pure work that got them there. Like, and they'll tell you that. So yeah, it's kind of, it definitely, yeah, kind of just push you on. You're like, oh, I just want to get there. Like, What's next for this team, for this, I guess, very exciting crop of, of young runners at the moment, Keelan, for yourself and your mates, basically? You, you obviously mentioned Kenya is up next in a, in a few weeks' time for a bit more training, but, but what comes after that? Yeah, I suppose we all kind of have our own, our own separate race schedule in 2022, really, because you go back onto track and, like, I've still travelled with the last few races and stuff and we'll all go together. But, uh, yeah, I suppose the, this time next year is, is it's in uh, Turin, Italy, the... But uh, five of our team is still on that team uh, in Italy, and there's obviously other lads who could easily make it. So like we've just like we're saying, like, I know everything's on the day, and like, it could all go around, but we've easily got a chance next year to do every bit as well. So yeah, we'll all definitely be looking at it. All right. Well, very best of luck with everything that's coming down the tracks in in 2022. But mm-hmm. congratulations once again on Sunday, an absolutely incredible results. Keelan Carell, right, thanks a million. Thanks a million, lads. Cheers. Yeah. It is 10 minutes past nine on this Tuesday morning. You're with us here on OTBAM, which is brought to you by Gillette. Good mornings. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with your new and improved razors. Right, let's tell you what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. From one o'clock is OTB Gold, Wexford 1956 with Art Foley and Ned Wheeler. Three o'clock is the Dadcast. And four o'clock is a career retrospective with Matt Holland. OTB Gold then is up from six o'clock where Joe sits down with Ruby Walsh. And then seven o'clock off the ball is live on your radios. The snap on OTB is brought to you in association with the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Northwestern versus Nebraska at the Aviva Stadium is on Saturday, August 27th, 2022. You can check out collegefootballireland.com for full details. And during this ad break, you'll hear Kean Fahey on the Patriots offense. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Newspapers have called it the greatest club game ever. Munster legends Alan Quillen and Neil Briggs are joining forces to bring you all the latest analysis, news, interviews, and so much more. The strength of Munster rugby has always been the big boys up front. There's a lot of pressure on these guys continuously. I'm actually really, really excited for it. The Red 78 with Alan Quillen and Neil Briggs. Available every Wednesday. Don't miss a moment of action. Subscribe to the Rugby Channel on the OTB Sports app and turn on your notifications now. What would it possibly take for an NFL game to be called off? Because those were borderline unplayable conditions as the, as the thing approached. But the show must go on, you know? COVID. <laughs> That's pretty much it. We had games called off last year. I don't think there's any weather. Like, you have those famous games with the, the Raiders and the Patriots and heaps of snow. Buffalo is famous for having snow, even though there was no snow at this game Monday night. But... The wind and like the there was a video beforehand of I think it was like Olszewski who was kicking the ball straight up mm. in the air and it was like blowing 100 meters behind him or whatever it was. You've got to be impressed with um, Josh Allen making being able to make actual throws in that wind. Like it shows you. Like, I think arm strength is massively overrated in general, but the guys who have those rocket arms can literally still throw the ball in storms. It's, it's insane to watch, and obviously it didn't help them, but it did at least allow the Bills to try things that the Patriots didn't even bother trying. I remember before this game, I kind of, I saw the conditions. I was finishing up at 11 o'clock. And I was going to bed and I was like, I'd pick up the score in the morning. But I said before in the game, this is just going to be randomness for four quarters. Nothing is going to actually be anything we take from this game moving forward. But Belichick went into it and decided to take all the randomness out of it. And he did that incredibly intelligently. And funnily enough, he wore a, a Navy face mask beforehand. And if you're unfamiliar with the uh, college game teams, they generally just run the ball. They don't look to pass the ball. So it's as if he was hinting to what he was going to do in his game plan. Uh, Mac Jones threw a screen. Uh, he threw a check down, I believe, and he tried to throw another screen. Or no, sorry, he threw a play action pass to, to John Smith over the, over the middle. He literally did nothing throughout the game. He might have made some audibles to change into different running plays. But I do think this game really highlighted the, uh, the way in which the Patriots draft running backs. Because... It wasn't just Harris. Harris broke off the big play at the start of the game. The other backs they had, even Brandon Bolden, who feels like he's been there for 20 years, they have guys who can run all different play designs. So if you want to run a counter play in you, your misdirection, moving the defense left and you go right, if you want to use a trap play where they have to be a little bit patient before accelerating, if you want to toss the ball outside, they'll show the patience to wait for their blockers to get outside. If you want to just run between the tackles over and over again, they can all do this. 
So they never have the superstar back. They never have the Saquon Barkley with the exceptional athleticism. But they have running backs who are all very intelligent and very smart in how they run plays. And that's critical for how they beat the Bills because if you're only going to run the ball, they'll just stack up against the run. So you have to be able to run in 10 different ways. And you saw when they got to like third and five and third and six, they were tossing the ball outside because the Bills were crashing inside expecting to run. And it, it was just... It's a coaching masterclass, but that's what you expect from Belichick. And anyone who was watching last season and going, oh, he was always played by Brady. I mean, we're seven, seven wins in a row. But even without those seven wins in a row, it was a crazy take anyway, because he can always do stuff like this. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online. Then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited. Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Quarter past nine. You're very welcome back. It is time to turn our attention back to the Formula One. And we're going to touch on the Premier League in just a moment as well because Shane Hannon has been stewing on his hot egg for 48 hours almost. How are you, Shane? Morning, lads. How are things? How angry are you? <laughs> I don't know if angry is the word. Like when it was all going down on lap fifty-eight, I um, I was jumping up and down like everyone else. Uh, I don't. I think even the most fervent Formula One fan was probably a little bit confused as to what was happening. Um, like it, it just one of those moments. It was like a couple of years ago during the the World Snooker Championship semi-finals. There was two games that had me off my feet, um, jumping up and down at at how crazy it was. It was the same for that final lap. Um, you can call it sport, you can call it entertainment. It was probably a little bit of both, let's be honest. But what what ensued, I'm still confused about it. So, like, if I try and explain it to people in as in as simple a way as I can, like the moment for Stappen comes into the pits for for new hard tires during the virtual safety car earlier in the race, Hamilton didn't. Now, Red Bull are in this position that they can do whatever Hamilton doesn't do because they're in the lead in the championship. All they need to do is finish ahead of him. Uh, and they've won. So they can watch what Mercedes and Hamilton do and do the exact opposite. Now, Verstappen made up a little decent chunk of time when he moved to those hard tyres, but then kind of times began to fade away. It was clear that ha- that uh, Hamilton was going to go on and win this race. Didn't have enough to close the gap. Then the next Nicholas Latifi crash happens with under six, la- uh, six laps left. Safety car comes out. The entire strategy attempt number two by Red Bull, they figure, right, we'll do whatever Mercedes don't do. So that stacked up the field, the safety car coming out, of course. Uh, we're used to seeing that. The safety car comes out, the field gets stacked, the cars come closer together, um, and Verstappen comes into the pits for soft tyres. So there were questions then about whether the race could restart uh, from the grid, but Verstappen had nothing to lose at this stage. So it didn't matter whether Verstappen was running in second or twelfth if the race had restarted, as, as different journalists are pointing out. Uh, that The point was, Hamilton needs to stay it out. So... He was expressing a concern about his tyres during this time. This is the brilliant thing about Formula 1. I know you lads have talked about it already this morning. The entertainment level and what you can hear on the radios is, is quite extraordinary. But what, what unfolded with Verstappen taking these new tyres, the race did restart. We didn't know if it was going to restart. We didn't know if the race was going to end on the safety car. Um, can I ask Hamilton Shane, sorry played... to interrupt, as somebody who doesn't understand, why did Hamilton not get his tyres changed? What would have happened? Well, essentially... Essentially, Hamilton Hamilton wasn't sure whether the race was going to restart or not. Nobody was sure. But Verstappen, you see, Mercedes had to make the call. So they decided, right, we don't know if this race is going to restart. If we pit and we go into the pits and get new tyres, Verstappen will be ahead of us. There is no doubt about that. Um, so Red Bull could make that decision easily because they're already losing the race. I mean, they're coming second. As mm. I said, if Verstappen comes 12th or second, it doesn't matter. He's lost the World Championship. So... Pitting, pitting was an easy decision for Red Bull. For Mercedes, they're thinking in their heads, okay, this is a risk because if the race doesn't restart, if this stays under the safety car, which we've seen happen before, and look, you mentioned Spa. Like I was there when, when the farce happened and, and the race was given, half points were given out because the race technically finished under a safety car. I thought that was going to happen. I actually was watching the, the end of the race on, on uh, Sunday afternoon and I was thinking this, this safety car will be there on, until the checkered flag. Hamilton will be champion and that's it. So... Red Bull made the decision to pit, you know, assuming that might happen also. There's no, there's nothing to lose for them here. Look, it doesn't change the, the controversial aspect of what happened. Verstappen had the advantage. He can do whatever Mercedes doesn't do. If Hamilton had pit on either occasions where, where the, the Red Bull of Verstappen pitted, he would have been behind. So 
I don't think either team could have made a, a different decision. That's the, the complicated nature of it. But this is something that we're going to be talking about for decades to come, it has to be said. It, it will surely lead to a new rule being written in, right? Where they will say that if there is less than two laps remaining in the race, we cannot finish this thing behind a safety car. Is, is that just what needs to get written into the rule book here? Because the thing is, from what you're saying there, had Mercedes know what was going to happen, they obviously would have pitted Hamilton, right? Yeah, but this is the thing, Owen, as well. Like, we talk about the rule book, um, but a lot of people are, are reading into, and a lot of people who have been following Formula One for much longer than me have been reading into this rule book and looking into the FIA regulations and still are, are unsure whether Michael Massey made the correct the correct call here. Um, like, he's the man with his finger on the red button towards the end of the race. He decides whether these lapped cars can, can overtake uh, the safety car and which lapped cars can overtake the safety car. He's the one who made the point. He's like the... Like John was speaking there with the Netflixization of sport, and I, I see what he means by that. But like at the end of the day, Michael Massey is is he's like the cousin Greg. He's the attack dog of Formula One. He's <laughs> like he he is the person who is probably bring has just brought so many more hundreds of thousands of viewers to Formula One for next Which, year. Are we sure it's not Tom Wamsgams here a little bit? I think cousin, cousin Greg lost seven hundred and fifty million. That's not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, but like. He, he's the guy who has to bring more fans into Formula One. Now, whether or not he made that decision uh, because of those reasons um, on, on Sunday, we will never know. Uh, the fact of the matter is, lads, and, and this is something that people are forgetting. Yes, Lewis Hamilton looked the stronger, the stronger racer on Sunday afternoon, but realistically, Max Verstappen you know, qualified on pole. He had most poles throughout the year. He had the most podiums throughout the year. He had the most points clearly throughout the year. Um, he had a P9 in Hungary earlier in the season, but Besides that race, he finished in the top two in every single race across the season. He was the most consistent driver across the year. So you cannot you cannot question his deserving of, of winning this world title. Now, Lewis Hamilton will be back, of course, next year. But really, Hamilton, like, look, he led 51 of the first 57 laps. because So, of course, you're going to feel for the man. But really, Max Verstappen is a, is a deserving champion. And I think Lewis Hamilton's um, quiet nature that you mentioned earlier, Owen, after the race, probably hints at that. Like on the podium, he was quite quiet. He sat in the car, didn't say anything. Some people suggested that's because he was waiting for these investigations to come through and Mercedes to do their thing with the FIA. But really, I think he just accepts the fact that he can't, he can't fault Max Verstappen winning oh. Mean this. Uh, Pierce Morgan tweeting. Oh, oh he's there. You're robbed back. by rude landing officials. It's a joke. But like, look, this is what the British media do anyway. It's Lewis Hamilton is is a fantastic champion, uh, and and he's gained a lot of fans probably since the weekend even as well. But you can't take it away from Max Verstappen. In fairness, the, the sitting in the car thing. Like I can relate with that. Like I sometimes just drive home and just sit in the car for a while, and I'm just too lazy to get out of the car. I'm just I'm just too tired. I just want to sit here for a few more minutes. To be quite honest with you, so I can I can completely appreciate that. Uh, Shane, why do you think everybody hates entertainment so much? Well, like, what? Why? Why have people become uh, so lacking in fun and lacking in joy that they've started to question why whether or not entertainment's a good thing? This is the thing. I think people, uh, the real fervent sports fans, think, uh, and, and ones who maybe tuned in for the first time for Formula One in a long time at the weekend, they they just had a sour taste in their mouths. They thought this isn't sport, but this this has always been Formula One. This is what happens. Crazy things happen. The FIA make decisions that eventually determine and ultimately determine the outcome of races. That's just that's just what that's just what the sport is. Um, they have to they have to do something. Someone in that in that room with Michael Massey in that room has to make a decision, and it has to be a split second decision. Um, you feel for the guy because I, I looked at a poll yesterday on on Twitter, and someone a, a Formula One journalist was maybe a thousand replies to this poll, asked, what would you have done? What do you think was the right decision? And the four options, I can't remember the exact four options, but one was Michael Massey made the right call. One was the race should have been restarted, red flagged and restarted uh, from the grid uh, and the, the final lap or two finished that way. Um, some people felt like the safety car or the safety cars, or the, the lap cars shouldn't have been allowed to overtake the safety cars. Of the options, there was essentially an even split between the four right. options. And like... So Michael Massey had a split second uh, or, you know, maybe 30 seconds to make a call that on a Twitter poll among a thousand people was fairly evenly split. I still think it was a controversial end and it will be talked about for some time to come. And I don't know what the right, I don't know what the right call was. I feel bad for Lewis Hamilton, but at the same time, Max first, like he, he, Mercedes had a couple of, they made a couple of bad calls potentially. 
at, during the race. But hindsight's twenty twenty, and uh, Max Verstappen overtook him on the final lap, as you said as well, Jer. So yeah. really, it, it just it it, it it does leave a bad taste in the mouth. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. That's the sport. Yeah, and and it were it's entertainment as Owen wants. Um, can I ask you about what happens next in terms of that rivalry? I was just googling the age there. Lewis Hamilton's thirty six, and he has kind of hinted in the past that. He might finish a little bit earlier than maybe expected. Schumacher retired, I think, at 38 for the first time and then came back three years later and did another couple of seasons. So what's realistic for him to continue over the next few seasons and to build this rivalry and to take the sport to the crescendo that it seems like it's trending towards? Yeah, like Hamilton, Hamilton, even in advance of the last race there was speak, was ta- asked about the eighth world title and, and was he focused on winning this eighth world title and beating Michael Schumacher's record? And he he was saying, you know, um, it doesn't interest me. I haven't really thought about it, but that we all know that's a lie. Um, he's sitting on seven with Schumacher now. Schumacher, you know, his hero, essentially. Of course, he wants to overtake him. He's, he's not going to quit until he gets another two or three years. The thing about it is, he spoke about Valtteri Bottas being an incredible teammate at Mercedes. But George Russell comes in next year to Mercedes into that seat um, and Bottas heads off to Alfa Romeo. Like, George Russell is a driver who can challenge Lewis Hamilton. Uh, we, we, could see, we could see a trio of Hamilton, Verstappen and Russell challenging for the world title next year, essentially. Uh, that's how good I think George Russell is. Um, so all of a sudden, he's got a teammate, not like Valtteri Bottas, who's a great little teammate who helps him out and you know keeps uh, Verstappen at bay the odd time, but he's got a teammate now who's challenging him as well, uh, which is probably going to fire a rocket up his ass, to be honest. Lewis Hamilton wants that. At 36 years of age, you need some, you need some further uh, motivation to, to stay in the sport, without a shadow of a doubt. You talk about good teammates, like Czech, a word has to be said for Sergio Perez. Checo Perez kept Hamilton at bay, and that's another reason why they won at the weekend. He kept him at bay for, for a few laps and and extraordinary driving by, by Checo Perez to do that and kind of hold him up and let Max kind of close down the lead for a bit. Ultimately, onto the safety car, it didn't really have much of an imp- impact. But Bottas started P6, Checo Perez started P4, so he had an impact on the race. Bottas didn't. But in terms of the rivalry, Ger, like Verstappen's, Verstappen's going to win multiple world titles. You look at the age the age profile of the Formula 1 grid at the minute, you've got, I guess, some of the older guys like, like Hamilton, like Sebastian Vettel, uh, Bottas as well, Kimi Raikkonen's gone, Fernando Alonso is still there. But really, the, 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 the curve is heading downwards. You've got George Russell, you've got Max Verstappen, Mick Schumacher, you've got all these drivers coming through who are, who are uh, going to dominate the sport over the next couple of years. This rivalry is not going to last long. Uh, it's going to be a year or two, I'd imagine, until Lewis Hamilton uh, hangs up his helmet or whatever the, uh, the F1 term for retirement is. Um, I'm looking forward to next year. I think next year is going to be fireworks. Um, but... I don't think Hamilton wants to go out uh, this this way. You know, he wants to win that eighth world title, and, and <laughs> next year is going to be fascinating with George Russell in the in the, in the other Mercedes seat. And it's, in a, we've seen it like we've seen what George Russell can do in a Williams car. George Russell has got points before in in a Williams car. Now, it, it's it's on a par with Haas probably in terms of the worst car in the grid, uh, and that's what he can do in the worst car in the grid. So stick him into a Mercedes, and uh, let's see what he can do. Plenty of comments coming in, as you can imagine, on this. Shane has said, don't forget the start of the race where Hamilton should have given his position back to Max. Andrew mm. says, looking forward to the courtroom episode of Drive to Survive. And then mm-hmm. Bobby Trust says, so can they only appeal to the organisation itself to look into potential corruption within the organisation? Doesn't sound dodgy at all. Uh, basically, I think in Bobby Trust wants to see this go all the way to Cass. <laughs> like, it's a fair point. Like It's a fair point. And the, the word you mentioned earlier, Owen, um, manipulated like that that's what Hamilton said over the radio it's the only thing and, and if you watch it back now it is like a it is like a Shakespearean drama that final lap uh, everything that happened so much was happening in such a short space of time my jaw my jaw my jaw was on the floor watching it I didn't know what I didn't know what way to to look um and all you hear over the car radio from Hamilton you obviously hear the Toto Wolf which John Duggan by the way did a stellar impression of uh, a few minutes ago but the the moment where Hamilton just goes when just before the final turn, when he realizes he, there's no catching Max Verstappen, he's two and a half seconds ahead, he just says, This is manipulated, man. And you can hear the sorrow in his voice. He's like, This is manipulated. That's how he feels. So if that's how he felt during the race and he was so uh, dignified and full of decorum after the race, I wonder, was he just biting his tongue a little bit? And, and we're going to hear what Lewis Hamilton really thinks at some stage in, in, in the coming weeks. I think we will. I think Lewis Hamilton is going to finally come out when the, when the dust has settled and he's let Max Verstappen enjoy his victory because that's what he's doing. He's 36 years of age. He's won seven world titles. 
He, he knows what it's like to win a first world title. In 2008, he did it in the most dramatic of circumstances, just like Max Verstappen. I think what Lewis Hamilton is doing here is standing back, letting Max Verstappen enjoy his moment, not ruining it on, it on him, let him celebrate and let him have his fun. And then in a few weeks, when the dust has settled, he's going to finally tell us what he really thinks uh, about this decision about the FIA. That's that's my take anyway. But uh, look, it's it's just a fascinating finish to, to what a fascinating season. We still haven't heard from Wolf, though, have we? In a, in a public setting, like he's, he's probably saving the exclusive for someone. He's going to go and sell it to Oprah, and he'll be like, "Screw <laughs> you, Formula One channels. This is this is what I'm doing with my exclusive because that that's what we want. That's the final piece in the jigsaw. From my perspective, anyway, the appeals are probably all going to be rejected, right? I think that's what we can all uh, accept mm-hmm. over the course of the next next little while that the result will stand. But it's just just that Toto Wolf interview, which I'm going to be really interested in. Um, that is pretty much it for the Formula One reaction to the weekend. We want to keep you on the line there, Shane, because we want to do a mini deal or no deal. It's not January yet. We're about halfway mm-hmm. through December at this point, but deal or no deal will be back in January uh, for a busy month of speculation and absolutely no transfers whatsoever. Jar? Well, he's, he's a United fan. What do you think? Are you, are you team Ralph? Uh, Ralphie's at the wheel, lads. Ralphie's at the wheel. Um... Now, it's going to take him a little bit of time. Two wins, two clean sheets, uh, granted against Palace and, and Norwich. But I like I like the cut of his jib. I, I, I like the way he talks. Uh, it's not like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer post-match interviews where, you know, after a defeat or after a, a narrow 1-0 win away to Norwich, Solskjaer might say something like, this is United, we are United, we are, you know, we're doing something here. We have a plan. Solskjaer didn't have a plan, let's be honest. I still like the guy and I still think he's the best manager since the... Uh, in, in the post Ferguson era that Manchester United have had, but is he? Reinick, was he? Well, no bar. in terms of what he achieved, maybe not the best manager on paper. Jose Mourinho was what clearly a better achieve? manager. Louis Van Hal. Van Hal won uh, the FA Cup. He did. He did, of course. And, and and look, I say that in the knowledge that Solskjaer did, didn't win a trophy at United, but in terms of what he what he created at the club, the signings he brought in, uh, what he did with the younger players as well, and and most importantly, the the attitude the fans had. Um, starting to enjoy games more. Like, under Mourinho and Van Hal, it was torturous watching United, um, not just because of results, but because of performances. And Solskjaer changed that. He changed the way they played. Um, and look, he can't take all the credit for that. I'm sure there's there's coaching decisions as well behind the scenes. But really, if, from an enjoyment perspective, I think he's the best manager United have had in the post-Ferguson era. Well, Rangnick, like, Rangnick, Rangnick's doing what he's doing so far. It, it's it's going to take a little bit of time to bet in, but he's got a seriously, seriously tasty group of fixtures coming up in terms of uh, ease. So as long as they he happen. should be winning. Say that again. As long as the fixtures actually happen, of course. That's well. That's bit, this is the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's hard to know. Uh, one deal to put to you then. In the Netherlands, Frankie de Jong's father has said that the top five clubs in Europe all want his son. Bayern Munich or Manchester United are believed to be interested. However, his dad says either destination could be a hard sell because it's often bad weather there. Should Manchester United sign him? <laughs> the bad weather comment, I mean, who's going to have sympathy for these fo- these footballers on, uh, you know, the multi-millionaire footballers who can't play in bad weather? I, I think, look, his father's probably just... It's not rain along the Netherlands as well? I'm sure it does. Yeah, you're just off the, the North Sea there. I'm sure you get a little bit of bad weather. Um, enough enough moisture to grow nice flowers anyway in the Netherlands. But like top five clubs in Europe. So is he saying that Manchester United are one of the top five five clubs in Europe? Is that is that his point? He says the top five clubs in Europe want his son. So I assume he's including United in that Yeah, uh, for some reason. But it's nice yeah, obviously he's... Tinty put on it there. Like it's a good signing. Of course, Frankie de Jong's a good signing. I think, and as someone who made the point last night, was it Pat Nevin last night or someone maybe recently making the point that he should probably bring in a load of German players and that's probably what he's going to do. Like if Rangnick, if anyone's going to know the top players in the Bundesliga that uh, are being unnoticed um, and underrated, then Ralph Rangnick will. So uh, look, Frankie Dion, like clearly that's a position that United need, but maybe he wants to come and join his his mate Donny van der Beek and sit on the bench because van der Beek was, was extremely highly rated before he, he joined United. So if uh, Frankie de Jong is on the phone to Donny van der Beek in any way, shape or form, he will be told to stay well clear of Manchester United, I think. So uh, I'd be surprised if he went to Old Trafford. Yeah, so would I. Deal or no deal, Ger? No deal. No deal, okay. Mm-hmm. I see that, I like that little taster. We've probably got you in the appetite now for the January transfer window to slam open on the 1st of January and uh, <laughs> deal or no it's deal. It's going to be wild. It could be wild, like all that Newcastle money sloshing around. Like Pogba going. I mean, they've got to get rid of as many. They've got to get rid of as many players as they can in this transfer window to give them a nice clear run at the summer. Yeah, they certainly will. It's going to be very interesting. Shane, good stuff. Cheers, good lads. stuff. We'll chat to you tomorrow morning as well. Uh, OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. 
with your best face forward with their new and improved razors. And tomorrow morning, we are going to be hearing from Fintan Jury, who's got one of the most interesting careers around Irish sport. We've got midweek football to react to. And our next gift guide with Jess Kelly is coming your way, so you don't want to miss that. Right now, though, at 9.34 on this Tuesday morning, here is Pat Nevin talking football. Nevin, how you doing? I'm surprisingly well since I had my booster jab today from my oh, third one. So they, they tell you it hurt, uh, hurts your arm or something, but so far it's actually given me a boost, my booster. So <laughs> go for it, everyone. Well, you guys are all going all out. I saw Boris last night. I mean, not that he would be using uh, a, a broadcast of that nature to distract from his own woes, but he was uh, I, I, trying to look, I would think, very uh, prime ministerial. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, your patter's great. <laughs> it's never looked prime ministerial in his life. Uh-huh. And yeah, it, it, he did try. He made a half an effort. He almost tried to comb his hair. Um, yeah. no, it's kind of... It's, if it, it wasn't so weird, it would be funny. Um, but on the positive side, on that one, certainly in that area, he's saying the right things and uh, everyone's kind of going for it, the big cues, etc. But the weird thing is I got a call. I was doing a signing, a book signing in Piccadilly Circus uh, a few days ago at the Waterstones down there. And, you know, before Christmas and lots of people signing your book. And I'm thinking, it's not great for Omicron. You know, you're behind a fucking up one of those plastic perspectives things. Anyway, since then, I've got about six people who said, by the way, I've got it. You know, I'm thinking, great. So I'm testing constantly, but absolutely nothing yet. Um, But it seems to be everywhere. In in London, it's just gone ballistic. And to bring it back to the football, you're right. It's going to create absolute havoc over the next few weeks. Mm. There is no doubt about it. It's going to create havoc. Um, And it's it's difficult to know what games are going to go ahead. I know the Spurs ones in doubt. Later this week in Wednesday, um, but there's going to be loads more as well. So it's, it is one of those ones where you know, the, the Premier League within two or three weeks is going to look very different. Yeah, no, there is that sense. Champions League draw today, take two in the end. I mean, if UEFA ever give you the, shit, the call, Pat, just think twice, make sure they're on top of all the details. I mean, that was unbelievable drama. So Manchester United go from PSG to suddenly Atletico. I mean, I'm sure they were. Happy to avoid BSG, but it's not the greatest draw either. So they have Atletico. Chelsea got Lille in draw one and Lille in draw two, for the conspiracy theorists out there. Uh, Manchester City got Sporting Lisbon. Liverpool have Inter. PSG Real Madrid catches the eye, obviously. Uh, Juve got Villarreal. Benfica Ajax and Orbi Salzburg play Bayern Munich. That is the Champions League draw for February 2022 and hopefully um, the Omicron seasonal burst that we're experiencing at the moment is behind us. So thoughts on that? The, the weirdest thing, I, you know, if you ever played for a club before, it doesn't matter what you say, people go, oh, you're biased towards them, right? Chelsea are the jammiest, luckiest gets with draws you ever get. Generally, you look at it, they, it's amazing the, the luck they get with the draws. I mean, it was somebody showed me a stat the other day about their FA Cup draws. They generally always get non-league teams in the first draw. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And this one, they wanted Leo. They got Leo. Then they didn't get Leo. Then they got Leo again. So you're thinking, piece of cake for them. The one that stands out, obviously, is the PSG one. I mean, that will be really interesting. It's, it's going to be an exciting game. Uh, a bit better from Real Madrid of late. Um, but I think what everyone is looking around, particularly... Uh, the English club's thinking, well, that's one of them two out. You know, that's good news. Mm. And that's pretty exciting. Also, RB Leipzig playing against Bayern, that, that's really interesting, really, because, you know, Leipzig, they'd had a tough time, hadn't they? But then suddenly they have that really good game against uh, City. So, you know, that actually could, probably won't kill off Bayern. But if you could almost see a way where this Champions League just suddenly just opens right out, and it's a fabulously open field, particularly for the English teams who have got a great chance of going through it. Mm. Um, but it was. It's, you know what it's like with these draws? Sometimes they just want to make it more and more complicated than it has to be. And come on, is there anybody out there who's not actually 
finding it quite funny, really. <laughs> just oh, thinking. It was great. It was uh, just good to laugh at all concerned. So on Chelsea, I mean, I look, there were a lot of penalties. I don't know if we want to go through all the penalties, do we? I mean, like, I, I, life no, feels not too all short. Of them. All right, go can on. I, can, I, can I very, I just, very quickly say I, one thing? Yes, you can. can I just, I, one thing? I will. I just, I just preface it by saying I just find all the penalty uh, talk and analysis so tiresome. I don't mind it at the time, but 24 hours on. But go on, no, hit me with a, an overarching point that we... we the want. overarching point yeah. would be, let's remember where we are looking down from, right? And it is generally the VAR. Right, so that's right. And we've had these com- conversations for hours. Mm. And you know that I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. You need to get working, but you are working. But the important thing is to make sure you get it working right. What they, where they've got to now, and it's bizarre that they've got there now, is that the VAR has now gone back to refereeing it. We know that might be a penalty, but it's not a definite penalty, so we're not going to give it back to the referee to look at. I mean. What bizarre world are we in now? You brought the thing in to get the things right. That's why you brought it in. You don't say, well, it's not an extreme and obvious enough penalty, so we're not going to let the referee referee it. We're going to referee it. And that, that's bizarre now. That they, have, they change the nuance of it all the time. Mm. They've now changed the nuance to, to such a degree that they're taking it off the referee. And I give you the analogy of, if you're then doing it that way, you're now refereeing it from a bunker somewhere out near Heathrow, right? Mm. How did we all feel with the first, I, I don't know if you watched it, Verstappen versus Hamilton? Verstappen didn't win it and Hamilton didn't lose it. The judges decided who won that. As soon as they made that decision to stop it, they let the five cars through and, and Verstappen sat behind them. I felt the same. Well, I watched the last lap, but Verstappen's going to win it, like, because mm. he's got new tyres and I've just let him get new. It was just, Somebody in a rule box and somebody in another box who's making a decision there decided who won the championship. After all that long work through it, we don't want that in football. Mm. <laughs> we want the guys on the ground to say, help me as much as you can and then I'll decide. But it's and it's it's so uncomfortable. And it may well be that Verstappen was the best driver, I don't know. But it's so uncomfortable to sit and watch that. And yes, it was a wee bit exciting in the end, but really... We knew he was going to win. And it's again a bit like that with penalty kicks. Now, some guy over in a, a room somewhere else is, is not even letting the referee go over to the monitor, which is there, yeah. to make his own decision. That, that's, that, that's annoying. No, I agree with you. That had been, I thought, they, they had, uh, through various hurdles and criticisms, found a sweet spot whereby the referee was being buzzed in his ear, come over, have a look. From the fans' perspective, from our perspective on TV, it's very dramatic when the referee is over having a look at the TV. It's half the theatre. And referee was then able to ref the game and had authority over the game. I don't know, like generally all the shifts and in nuance of VAR have followed a certain controversy. I thought it was going along very well, so I don't know what's prompted this change. And it's bizarre and it's completely wrong. If you think about it now, and I've not done all the stats, but if you think about it now, when the referee is called over there, he changes his decision, doesn't it? Generally. That's just the way it is. That's what happens, yeah. right? So now you think... 90% of the time or something like that, and I'm just saying it off the top of my head, but it's the vast majority of times because of the way they're talking about the ruling. And what you do is you get referees coming on now and go, well, the ruling is, and they tell you, well, it's wrong. It's not what it was supposed to be there for. And they get they get so messed up in that thinking. It's not there for you to clip onto this wee rule. It's you to there to try and get it right as often as possible. And it's that I've seen quite a few already this season where They've thought, well, it's not that obvious, so we'll not ask the referee to look at it. And had the referee looked at it, he'd, mm. he would have made his own decision. Mm. And it's just, it's a bizarre situation. And I think the one, maybe the West Ham one, was maybe the obvious one of that, you know, where you know, they're going to give a penalty for that, you know. But, he, oh, it's not that obvious a decision because nuances. No, no, the referee looks at it and goes, yeah, that, that'll be a penalty. You know, that's the upsetting thing of this week. And what we've got now, now all the big teams, they all you know, benefited fabulously from it, you know, getting all the penalties this week. And maybe there's an argument each of them in the course of the game probably deserved it. The game I was at, Liverpool, you know, Liverpool deserved to be winners. But you're now beginning to think, let's not go down that road where at the end of the season, you'll go back and say, well, that decision, that decision, and that that decision were the reasons why you win the league. Because the three at the top are so close. Mm. It may actually come down to that. And it's, that, that's, we don't want that. So you were at Anfield. You've seen your fair share of Stephen Gerrard teams in Scotland and now 
as he uh, gets his feet under the table at Aston Villa. What are the hallmarks of a Steven Gerrard team? Um, right, before we get into that, right, any Liverpool fans, could you just kind of leave the room just now for a moment? Well, I say something that's going to massively offend you. Right, caveats, Liverpool are great, Salah's fantastic, they were the better team, all that sort of stuff. Steven Gerrard, one of the best players and one of my favourite players and one of the best people that I've come across in the game. But, <laughs> after the game, he was saying, at Anfield, they got a penalty and we didn't, and we should have got one. And I'm going... Come on, Stevie. Hmm. Irony, mate. Come on. <laughs> we've all been there before. We've all played at Anfield. We've been rugby tackled in the box in front of the cop and not got a penalty. Come on, Stevie. You were there for 17 years. You must see the irony of this. And there was a glint of it. And I'm, I'm saying it in a light heart. I'm saying it as fun. But yeah. it was really like anyone who's ever played there or a fan of a team who's ever been there was going, oh, come on, Stevie. No, honestly. <laughs> it happens at Anfield. Trust me. Um, but they were great, they were good. And to be honest, he organised the team quite well, but they were, they were a good distance behind. The one thing about Stevie G, and I will say about him, he did a good job in, in, in Scotland, that's fine. I kind of like the cut of his jib as a manager. It looks good as well. He does make changes that work. Almost every game you watch him now, he makes adaptations that work. Now, the classic comeback from that is, well, why didn't he do that in the first place? Mm. <laughs> but... In reality, you need to see how a game's going and you make a change that works. When he made the change against Liverpool there, they were getting hammered. They weren't getting out of their own box. And they, they, they basically just put two up front and adapted it slightly. They nearly got it back. And they were really unlucky. They should have got a penalty and they had a right good few chances. So the big thing about him, he's taken it and he's definitely not going to be swamped by it. He looks comfortable in it. He knows the players. He's getting as much out of the players. Um, as a previous manager, and I like Dean Smith as a manager, but Steven Gerrard is very early days, and it's the Premier League. But I would certainly bet on him being successful against him being not being successful. I think he's he'll, he'll do many. Every manager will take missteps; they all do. But his missteps, what they are, are very very limited so far, considering okay. the pressure of the job. Chelsea three leads two. That's eight goals conceded in a week now for Chelsea. I saw Thomas Tuchel was paying tribute to Jorginho, who you think you think Jorginho just kind of trots around silkily through a game and doesn't feel pain, but apparently he's had terrible back problems over the last while because he's played so much football and he's going through the pain barrier in the absence of Kovacic and Kante and Tuchel was saying, you know, what a guy. Uh, that's not my question. My question is about Lukaku. So raise an eyebrow when I see he comes on in the 87th minute. So, what's the value of, of this? This is not trying to get fitness into a man. This is, um, you know, not necessarily giving him time to score goals either. He was out for five games with an injury. He's been back since November the 28th, the Manchester United game, and is yet to start a game. What's the story here, please? Does, doesn't look mobile. Um, the bits of games, I mean, he played a whole half a game at one point, and I was at the game and just didn't look mobile. Okay. Didn't look exactly. He could get about the place as in quickly. as in still not fully fit or like uh, I just, out of shape. You always level. think it's physique. You always think it's physique with him. He, he was never the biggest runner about, and you know from years we've been talking to each other for years. Yeah. You know my feelings, feelings of Lukaku is, look, he's never going to be a great worker. Mm. He never did put the, so it's not in there. That the was your that was your big criticism. I remember of him at Everton. Yeah, and I, it upset me a lot because I'm thinking you've got all the skill and talent in the world, mate, but. Don't just work when the ball's near you. You need to do the other stuff so you drag people apart. And he's, he's just not that player. So when you get an injury like that and you are kind of big belt anyway, coming back from it takes you twice as long as anybody else. Because they've got that inbuilt stuff there that's still in there. There's still petrol in the tank, as it were. I'm going to sound like petrol head after a minute. <laughs> but they're still, they're still there. But if you've never stuck that in there, you've been running kind of near empty anyway. So it's gone. It takes that much longer to get back in. And when you look at it, sometimes it's in comparison with others and you see the energies of Havertz and you see the energies of Tino Werner or Mount or I could go on and on and on. And it actually makes it look a bit worse. So he may be still carrying a wee bit of injury. He's certainly got nowhere near match speed. There are, I've known many players I've played with in my, my life and watched many who, if they don't play every week, it's a nightmare. Because you're gonna, you almost need to give them a pre-season again to get them back there again. You don't get a pre-season during the, the season, 
So it's, Tuchel would play him if he's right. There's no negativity of Tuchel towards him or indeed anyone. Okay. His thing is, you've got to make sure that you, when you're out, you do every single bit of work to make sure you come back and you can spring as close to normal. And he's, he's, not, he's not there yet. He's not there yet. Um, and you can tell a bit, this is not me as well speaking, you can talk about Chelsea fans. They've got a £95 million strike and I can't even hear anybody saying, get Romelu on, we need him to start. I can't see it. It's not happening. Because mm. they all know, get him on when he's right. Mm. Fair enough. Mm. And the sad thing is, I'll give him this one, which is a real shame for him. He's been brought on a couple of times and usually it's been when they've not had their crosses on, like Reese James, he played centrally. And so he's not, the crosses, the stuff that he lives off of, he's not, he's not been there. And then when he's not on the pitch, suddenly the crosses are all firing in. So it's a it's a really, really tricky one. Chelsea need them. They really could do with them fairly soon because like everyone else, they're not exactly running out of players, but everyone's getting stretched just now. And they're quite close to it. Fortunately, up front's not the problem. Actually, the back's not the problem. It's that central there. Yeah. The no, they, they, they definitely look a, a touch lightweight by comparison with where they were. Our football coverage as we talk here to Pat and Evan is brought to you by Sky. Don't miss Man City Leeds tomorrow, live only on BT Sport. Hey, we're talking energy. Can we touch on man of the moment here? I think everybody is enjoying watching Conor Gallagher. It hurts me to say Gallagher, but I'll call him by his correct name. Conor Gallagher of uh, Crystal Palace, of course, on loan from Chelsea. 21 years of age. I think he's become cult hero at Palace very quickly. He scored his fifth and sixth goals of the season yesterday. Three assists thrown in. So that's uh, nine goal contributions this season thus far. But really, what he's about, as much as anything, is energy. So he ran 11.2k against Everton, uh, 20 sprints thrown in, 347 intensive runs, which puts him top of the pile for the weekend. And he scored those two great goals. And even the, the goal in the 93rd minute, he was right beside Coleman when Coleman takes the quick free. And just he's such an eager beaver. He's sprinting back and somehow ball pops to him and he whips it in. It just shows, like, there's a lot of uh, very important uh, subtle nuances to the game. But, 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 man, if you just run around a lot and have energy, a lot of good things happen for you. He's a um, really tidy player. Is he going to go back to Chelsea, do we think? Um, I can't imagine they wouldn't bring him back because of what he's delivering just now. Um, the only downside is, is the similarities to Mason Mount. And Mount's back on a really good sort of stream of... Um, games just now, and it's the difficult they've had with a few players, but they let players out and they let them develop a wee bit then drag them back in, and when it works, it works and it looks absolutely fantastic, worked with Reese James fantastically well I suspect they feel as if they shouldn't have let Billy Gilmer out because of where they are in the central midfield just now. but they, they never knew they would get three injuries in that area now. but they're looking at Gallagher, and the problem with Gallagher is, they're actually alright there, mm. they're okay in that position I went, I went to see, uh, I was at the Palace Man United game. And to be honest, it was rubbish. Oh, was <laughs> Just, he? Was he? Yeah. Wow. I was so disappointed. And I was thinking, I'm, I really want to like every bit of thing he does because every time I've seen him before that, and I've, it jumped to me. I've watched him now play two very poor games. And they, they weren't just average, they were quite poor. Right. And both things for the same reason. They put him as a sitting midfielder. Oh, okay. Because he's got energy and they want him to close down right. He did that against Man United. And Chelsea done at the start of the season, he played against Bournemouth. And honestly, fish it a lot. You stick him a little bit further forward and he's absolutely fantastic. So I actually don't blame him in any way whatsoever for those two boot games. He was just put in the wrong place. And by the way, he tried to work his way out of it, but it's just not that position. That's mm. not who he is. Yeah. When he's put in those further up areas, it, honestly, I agree with you completely. He's... You know, there's a few players around like that. And isn't it great to see, you know, the McGinn's of this world and Gallagher's. I would put Mount in there as well. There's players that you think, yeah, there was, there was a bit Rashford for the first half against uh, Palace last the other week. Yeah, energy, Rashford couldn't, couldn't keep it up for the 90. But when you see them doing it like that, the question then comes about how long can you keep it going for? Because we do actually see some of them, not exactly burning out, but, well, they break down. That's such an interesting comment because I mean, look, swashbuckling and the long blonde hair—it's just the, fun to watch and it's rock and roll. Let me add a Premier League; I'll have you all day. Patrick Vieira's asked about him, so you would think this is a chance for Vieira to be nothing but effusive. 
and he had a very interesting line. He said, Connor will need to manage his strength and find out the best way to manage his energy. I thought, mm. oh, that's a downer. But, uh, but Vieira's not saying this for nothing. It was a really interesting comment. Yeah, I mean, I have watched players over the years where you expend too much energy in the wrong time. And it's fine, because for that eight minutes, you feel great. By the way, you're doing it on Tuesday again, and you're doing it on Saturday again, and yeah. you're doing it next Tuesday again. And eventually, if you're not 100% fit, which most of the players, we never really were, because we were injured in something, it will wear you down. Mm. And you can see it with a variety of players. So you have to keep the energy. They used to always say to you, try and keep it ticking at about 90%. If you can t keep it ticking at about 90, you're fine. No one's wanting you to get up to 100 and push the envelope for every part of every single game because you know what happens. You're mm. human beings. You, you'll blow. This is, this is almost the art of being a professional. Yeah, and they know when to do it. Now, there's, there then comes this very delicate position where you think, okay, I'll just save energy. And then you're spending more time saving energy and you're then not the player you were. Yes. So... Vieira's absolutely nailed on spot on right. Keep that 90. And then when you push it for 10, 15 minutes to the 100 or whatever, that's great. You keep that 90, you'll probably be able to keep on going for quite a long time. But it's so hard telling that to a young guy because when you're young, you're, you're, you're absolutely, you live forever. You can run forever. Yeah. You, I can never remember feeling tired before I was 25. Just run all day. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, he, yes, yeah. yeah, I'm sure it does. Well, yeah, he looks like a guy who's 100% fit right now. Nothing's yeah. hurt. And, it, and, it, and, and at some point, that, that will not be yeah. the case. So I understand that management thing. And he's not saying slow down, take it easy, play like Jorginho at the back. He's not saying that. He's saying, look, you will not be able to go for that. You won't be 33 doing that. Yeah. Manage it to some degree, some level. It's not, it sounds like a downer, but. Honestly, it isn't. It's very, very intelligent. Yeah, no, no. I figured it was a shrewd observation from the the unexcited scene at all before uh, Patrick Vieira, you know. But it was it was uh, an interesting one publicly. Another public comment from Mikel Arteta on Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. I think we all had a sense something was brewing here. Substituted at Old Trafford when they were chasing a goal, left on the bench for a couple of games since. They won at the weekend, which I think gives Arteta a certain a bit of stature and leverage to, to make the you know make these things public. So he said Aubameyang out for disciplinary reasons and wouldn't uh, reveal what those issues were. Now the reporting, these things always leak out, the reporting seems to be Aubameyang was given permission to travel abroad for whatever reason and he was late coming home and particularly in light of COVID this caused all sorts of issues and so Arteta took action. Which I think is a very admirable thing to do and it might be short-term pain because I think in the short term you can kind of get away with letting the big boys do what they want a little bit and as a manager that might be tempting get them on the field but then you might create a, a culture that you don't want the youngsters seeing so I got, this is one of the first times I looked at Arteta, Arteta and thought okay that's a bit of steel there I like this I oh, love it absolutely behind them and what was quite noticeable in the game the, the weekend you see the young ones that were getting the game the energy levels the kind of because, OK, they'll look at Aubameyang and what he's done before and the goals he scored and all that sort of stuff. But the professionals, you know, think, yeah, but I want his place. I'm, I, I want to show what he's not doing for us, I'll do it for us. Because it doesn't matter who's in front of you. You want that. Mm. You want to take it. You want to grab it off them. And for them, they could have all thought, oh, that's our mate getting treated badly. And if it's your mate getting treated badly and he's not been misbehaving, you've got a problem. But if he's been not doing the right things and you are want to do the right things, you got oddly you got a boost out of it. Yeah. The players have got a boost out of it. And there is it looked very much like that. And as that game developed all day, you know, three now could have been five, six, whatever. And there looked a lot of energy about that group. And I I, I have to say I'm with you and I think there'll be plenty of Arsenal fans. They just want to see that level of effort from everyone. Yeah. And I think just people have got very, very bored with the people that aren't doing the work now. Now, some yeah. have got a good reason for it. If you're too old to be able to do it, you need to manage it in a certain way. But from him, you're thinking, no, you want more. And he's your captain. He's your captain, yeah. Because Thomas Tuchel was talking last year. In this, I, These are old quotes, and this must have been in advance of some 
game against Arsenal or something because you know he was asked about Aubameyang and obviously he managed him so this gives a nice insight I think into the personality of Aubameyang good and bad uh, back in the days at Dortmund said Tuchel it was a pure pleasure to have him in the squad uh, Oba was a fantastic striker fantastic finisher but more than that he was a fantastic worker off the pitch he didn't miss one single training session in two years maybe he arrived five minutes late on the training ground that can happen with him but if he does this he's in a hurry he excuses he feels sorry has a smile on his face and when we wanted to get him to a meeting at 11 we would tell him it was at 10.45 so there was a good chance he might be there with everyone else it was a pleasure to work with him we're still in touch he's a bit of a crazy guy but it's a nice crazy we still talk a very very honest guy so it's compl- it doesn't sound like Aubameyang sulking and not putting it in either, but there's just a, a line you have to draw maybe. And it depends. I'm not sure Tuchel would take that now. Right. Where he is just now. I, I'm really not sure he would do. Um, but there are certain players. I mean, you go back to Cantona. Did you want to treat him exactly the same as everything? What else? There, there comes a balance, and everybody knows there is a balance. Mm. That you have to decide. Am I going to take that with the possible negatives that it has for everyone else who's got a different set of rules with the ability? And there is a point where you say, yeah, I'll do it. If you're Diego Maradona, yeah, muck about it, do whatever you like. So you come and win the game for us, it's fine. See, when you drop below that, you are dumped quicker than you can walk. <laughs> you, know, you have no idea how quick everybody wants rid of you and the managers want rid of them. And it's very, very noticeable. OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razor.